you're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lawton. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Wednesday evening. Do the best that I can to get through this one. My voice is a little bit sore. Um, <clears throat> somebody sent to me a critique of my conversion story that I um, did there with Matt Frad a few, I want to say a few days ago, wasn't it? A week or so. And, um, yeah, they uh, reviewed it on Ancient Faith Radio, Father Thomas Soroka. Uh, he has a, a show on there, and he, he was joined by Father Daniel Latier, and they, uh, you know, gave some uh, responses to some of my comments, and I'm going to engage those. You know, I was able to get in touch with Father Daniel Latier, who, who's the one, you know, engaging the material the most he's he's kind of the guest and uh the host father thomas is just kind of asking questions <clears throat> and i was able to get in touch with father daniel i know that um a while back i emailed him i think this was back when i was still orthodox and invited him on um but i don't think he was able to come on at that time but i was able to get in touch with him again after i i saw the the critique and um we, we had an excellent conversation, great guy, really enjoyed it, and look forward to having him on. He's going to be on the show, I already put it on the calendar, I think it's maybe, I forget, mid-May, somewhere around there, y'all y'all definitely check it out, uh, but it should already be on there, he, and he's going to be on, um, we're still trying to figure out a topic, so I'll, I'll get back to y'all on that, but Father uh, Daniel, who's again, Eastern Orthodox, um, priest who, who was formerly uh eastern catholic i believe and um became an eastern orthodox priest um and you're gonna again hear him today uh as we go through the show uh he'll be on the show so um i appreciate him doing that you know and i, I want to interact with what i've i've heard their comments and criticism and interaction i do want to say a couple prelim preliminary <laughs> remarks before we dive in uh, to the content itself, you know, I, I will note, I, you know, and I, I'm assuming very, very good intentions on their part, but I, I don't know if they actually listened to the interview, um, not in, in its entirety. It, let me give you one example, and there's many, but here, here's just one. There was one part where a questioner at the end asked a question. They asked a question, not I. They, it was their words. They read that questioner's question as a quote and then attributed it to me. The host did, Father Thomas. He explicitly attributed it to me. And the questioner had a word in there that wasn't the best, and I agree with them. And then they then critiqued it as if they're critiquing me, and they attributed it to me. But I never said that. And I would never have been so irresponsible as to have used the term that they used. And we'll get to it in a little bit. <clears throat> I'm much more nuanced than that. I would have never had phrased the question in, in the way that the uh, commenter did, even though, I mean, the commenter is a good guy. I know him. I don't agree with his comment necessarily. Um, but to misattribute a direct quote by somebody else that's so clear in the video that it's somebody else. It's Matt Frad reading the questioner's uh, question and then attribute it to me and then go on to critique that question as if it's me. That I, I'm not attributing ill will. I, I don't think that they deliberately are saying, oh, well, let me let me just grab this and just say that Michael said it. But <laughs> That, that's not what's going on. There, there's no conspiracy here. They're not trying to actively misrepresent me. I'm sure of it. What I'm not sure about is, did they even watch the thing? Because if they did, you would have known I didn't say that. That wasn't me. That's just one example. There, there were others in there to where I'm just thinking, you didn't really listen now, did you? <laughs> we're, we're missing some information here. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully, uh, maybe they'll, they'll see this and they'll say, okay, well, maybe we, we didn't 
do it justice and maybe engage it further. Who knows? But uh, that's what I want to do is dive in, go over some of this, respond to some of the things that they tried to engage as well, and uh, take it from there. Now, I, I will say that at, at some points, the host, I don't know much about him. I don't know where he's coming from. I don't know what the background is. But I did get more of an impression that he seemed a little bit more, a little bit more biased in his tone. Um, and now I'm not necessarily saying that that was his intention. I'm just saying that's the way it came across. He had he he was talking about at the very beginning, and we'll hear it in just a minute. He's talking about people who have these conversion stories out of Eastern Orthodoxy, and they will give some criticisms of Orthodoxy. He's talking about them and he labels them detractors of Eastern Orthodoxy. And, and I'm just wondering, who does he have in mind? Because this is an entire show engaging my material. So who does he, who is he referring to as far as a detractor? Is it, is it me just because I go on a show and tell the reasons why I'm not Eastern Orthodoxy? Is that detraction? Um, or do we have somebody else in mind? And if so, who? But it kind of left the impression that or at least some people are going to get the, the impression that they're engaging now. They're about to review the content of a detractor. And so I felt that already muddied the waters and kind of poisoned the well a little bit uh, by starting out with that approach. And then even at the end, finishing it, uh, the host quotes, for, quotes 1 Peter 3, 14 through 16, which says this, but even if you should suffer for righteous sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And, you know, this is often used in apologetics. So I'm just like, well, OK. Uh, but then he continued, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. But why are you quoting this in a video interacting with my material? Am, am I guilty of reviling and slandering Eastern Orthodoxy. Again, it just kind of gives the impression that, I mean, it, it just seemed to be muddying the waters, poisoning the well a little bit and making it sound like uh, what they're doing is giving a response to detractors and people who slander the body of Christ. And that is what's going on in first Peter, but that's not what's going on with me. So, and by the way, I will say this, um, the only reason why I even did that topic is because I was asked to do that topic, right? When you're invited on a show, I mean, it's different with each show, right? But they gener I at least generally let them choose the topic. And I'm fine with the topic Matt chose. Nothing wrong with it. That was a good topic. But it's not like I was actively saying, mm, Matt, you know what? I want to go after the Orthodox. Let me tell you why I'm not Orthodox and why they're horrible and why Catholicism is the best thing. Yet. That's, that wasn't what was going on. I mean, generally, I would prefer to talk about the Magisterium or the Second Vatican Council or reactionary Catholics. I generally like to talk about, uh, just as far as preference, uh, things that we need to fix in the Catholic Church. But, I mean, that's just my preference. If somebody else wants me to talk on something else it's perfectly fine there's other great topics out there i'm just talking about what i personally prefer so i mean i agreed didn't have a problem with it but you almost get the impression like the host thinks that this was something that was just planned to target eastern orthodoxy and um I, that definitely was wasn't the case especially on my part and i don't get the impression that was the case on matt frad's part either uh, let me share my screen and we're going to listen to the audio. Unfortunately, they don't have video, so it's just going to be audio. We're going to start around the two minute, 30 second mark. Um, and then we'll go from there. Let me know if y'all can't hear, um, of course, the audio there. Let me know in the chat. Understand me. The Internet isn't filled with these presentations, but there is definitely a growing number of fairly high profile internet personalities among Roman Catholics and Protestants that have the Orthodox Church in their crosshairs. On the one hand, who's he talking about? Is it 
have the Orthodox Church in their crosshairs. Do you hear the language that's being used, the rhetoric that's used here? Crosshairs, as if somebody's just trying to pick on Orthodoxy and just, it, and it's and it's an attack. Of course, when you have your crosshairs on somebody, you're, you're trying to shoot them, right? You're trying to attack them. You're trying to kill them. Just, this kind of rhetoric already just poisons the well for the listeners. And I, I'm not sure was very helpful. If we're going to do a fair engagement, you know, of somebody's material, right? All right. Praise God. Our efforts to educate and evangelize and bring people into the church is having an effect. We're being noticed. On the other hand... No, no I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I hate to take the praise away from you, but that wasn't why we did this show. <laughs> Not because you're being noticed and, and there's all kinds of, uh, you know, things that you're putting out there that is really just visible. Not that they don't necessarily have that at H of Faith Radio, but that wasn't the intention. The motivation and intention was to um, explain my testimony because that's what I was asked. Now, on Matt Frad's part, I'm, I'm sure his intentions also aren't. I mean, you'd have to ask them what are intentions, but I guarantee they're not something uncharitable like, oh, let's just go and destroy those Orthodox because they're just gra getting so much momentum and traction and we just got to put an end to this. Uh, I guarantee that's not what he's thinking. <laughs> he's probably just thinking, Let, let's address this because some people are going to have questions. Well, what about Eastern Orthodoxy, right? And that's a fair question. Okay, well, what about it as an alternative to Catholicism because there's things going on in the Catholic Church that are discouraging. So let's take a look at Eastern Orthodoxy. I'm sure that's where Matt is coming from, right? Um, and this works both ways, by the way, daily, daily. I get multiple messages from people saying they've, they've left Eastern Orthodoxy and they're converting to Catholicism because, and then they give all kinds of theological reasons, spiritual reasons, stuff like that. So it, it really, it goes both ways. Uh, but yeah, let, let's move forward. And these presentations that are being given are often going unanswered. They're kind of one way street. When someone's going through the painful process of seeking out the Orthodox faith, it's likely they'll encounter these anti-Orthodox resources. To label this an anti-Orthodox, again, why the polemics? Why the rhetoric? Why, 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 why this approach? You know what? Why not engage this a little bit more charitably and just say, look, this person who left the faith is explaining the reasons why and they had legitimate concerns. And okay, they want to engage and interact with it, but as you're going to see, they didn't do a very good job at it. I mean, again, no, no offense to the fathers here. I'm just saying this is actually confirming my point because at one point in the interview, they noted, it, and I also noted it to Matt, I just don't get really sufficient answers back. And you're going to see that here. There, it's, it seems like they're oblivious to, to some things that are going on uh, that would undermine their position in some of the comments that they make. And I'll, I'll bring that out. In a little bit um <clears throat> yeah but um it's it, it is discouraging even though I'm, I'm sure they meant well they intended well they were trying to interact with the material all this does is just confirm to me even more that they don't have answers to this stuff now in fairness as father daniel is going to admit here in a little bit yeah your average orthodox priest is not going to have answers to these questions and i agree i agree I am aware of that. I've been painfully aware of that. I didn't expect that, right? As I don't expect the average priest who's Catholic to have very much, um, very much, uh, you know, very many answers to my questions. They generally don't. Um, <clears throat> so I, I already expect that on both sides. When I was saying I'm not getting answers, I'm not just talking about your regular average priest. I'm talking about the scholars too. That's who I'm talking about. They're assuming that I'm just talking about talking uh, to an average priest and, and they just couldn't give me any answers. There is that. I did present myself to the priest. I did present my concerns to him. I did consult other priests, present my concerns as well to them. But that's not all. I don't limit myself to just regular clergy, right? I mean, that's not their job. Their, their job isn't to be, you know, a, a scholar and, and to just search all these things out and know all the odds and ends. It's not their thing. 
All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's dive a little bit forward here. Uh, let's go to the 16-minute mark, the screen that I'm using to monitor uh, this show from is really far away, <laughs> and the timestamp is very, very small. Uh, let me move this, bring it over here, and make sure I get to the right timestamp. Yeah, we'll go right around here. This is approximately the, I don't know, 1553 mark, right around there. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so then I said, well, what are we doing in this, like, in this via media, this middle, this island of Eastern Catholicism where we share, feel like. And this is Father Latier speaking. We have things in common with the Orthodox, but we're not in formal union. We're in formal union with sure. the Roman Catholics. Sure. And we feel increasingly, you know, not in union with them. The and he's talking about his time in Eastern Catholicism and, and how he didn't really, he, he felt closer to the Orthodox and the Catholics from, from what it sounds like. Theologically, spiritually, mm -hmm. liturgically. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so the, that was my point at which it's like, okay, well, the papacy is really the last thing because, and, and this is, I think, where in, in something you see in Michael Lofton, who's, uh, video that we're examining tonight, um, you see this yeah. come out there, is as a Catholic, <laughs> you're taught that union with the Pope is the sign of the true church. So yeah. if, you're, if you're trying to be a faithful Catholic, you end up having a lot of problems with lots of things. And, and let me actually move this. What I'm going to do is move my screens. So that way I can just see it a little bit better. So let me stop screen, reshare it, and uh, should be now on a different computer again let me know if y'all can't hear the audio here's what they're what they're saying though <clears throat> they're saying as a catholic yeah the focus is to be on communion with the pope above all else above like liturgy above fasting above above you know those experiential kinds of practices mm, yeah i mean shouldn't objective truth be placed over emotions and feelings and experiences I'm, I mean, don't, don't we agree on that? I'm sure we agree on that. So, yeah, of course. Our claim is that the papacy is established by Christ. It's a divine institution, right? So if it is a divine institution, and this is exactly what I was saying when they were, you know, uh, quoting me here. This is exactly what I was talking about. If it's a divine institution, I don't have a choice but to be there, right? Right? Where else am I going to go? Something outside of God's will and God's covenant and God's community? Where else am I going to go? Of course you would be wherever, whatever Christ established, that's where you're going to go. Okay. So again, it all hinges, however, on the claim that Catholics make that the papacy is of divine institution, right? That it's of a divine origin. And that it's indefectible and one is to remain in communion with it. It all hinges on that claim. So now I have the burden and responsibility of proving that, right? Which we've done many times. We've had a lot of videos on the show um, talking about the papacy. So I'm not going to rehash that here. But I was just simply saying that if our claim is true, then it logically follows. I, I have nowhere else that I could go and I have to be in communion with this communion. If that claim is not true, yes. Uh, don't, don't waste your time with Catholic church. Please don't. Why, why be a Catholic? I mean, if this really isn't of divine institution, I can tell you a whole lot of other things you could be doing with your time than being a Catholic. So if, if, if our claims are false, yeah, don't waste your time. If our claims are true, you have no other choice. That is what I was getting at. All right. Again, let me know if y'all can't hear the audio. You know, you may very well go to a parish where the the liturgy, the mass is very uninspiring, mm -hmm. where the church yeah. is very he talks ugly, about that. Yeah. where, mm -hmm. you know, you don't, you know, there's really poor catechesis, you know. I mean, sounds like some Orthodox parishes that I know. Um, there, there's some poor catechesis at some Orthodox parishes. There is some bad liturgy. You can find your altar servers. You can find all kinds of liturgical abuses. You can find that kind of stuff at some Orthodox churches. And then some Orthodox churches, in fact, many of them, are great when it comes to liturgy. And some are good with catechesis, right? 
So, I mean, it's just kind of different depending on where, where you're going. But just because you go to a, you know, Eastern Orthodox parish and they have bad catechesis and a bad liturgy does not mean that Eastern Orthodoxy is false. Right. I mean, we, we agree that, with this. So uh, my personal experience of what happens at a local parish level does not determine truth. And I kept saying that over and over and over and over and over during the interview. We have to determine truth based on objective claims, right? Objective claims. Is the Catholic Church of divine institution? If the answer is yes, you have to be Catholic. If the answer is no, please don't waste your time on Catholicism. Yeah, look at Orthodoxy. Look at Protestantism. Maybe High Church Anglicanism. But look elsewhere. Don't waste your time with the Catholic Church at that point. That's what I'm getting at. Homilies are pretty rough, but you're supposed to kind of close your eyes and say, la, 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 la. I mean, whenever I hear a homily that's just Patriarch Bart's encyclical being read, there's no homily. Literally, all that's being read is his encyclical about the environment. I mean, <laughs> that's just as bad as some of the homilies that I've heard in the Catholic Church. Right? Let's be fair. You wouldn't say that that invalidates the claims of the Eastern Orthodox. And you're right, it doesn't. You're absolutely right, it doesn't. But why bring it up with us now? Why, why bring it up with us? Because my claim was not that we just have the most amazing liturgy at every parish and our homilies were just the most amazing thing ever. That wasn't my claim. My claim was, what is objectively true? If the papacy is of divine institution, that is where I have to go. That wasn't my claim. So to bring this up is just, again, muddying the waters. It's irrelevant. Uh, you know, but we're in union with the Pope and there's real presence in the mm -hmm. Eucharist. And so, yep. you know, that. But when I, when I actually started to look more in depth at the history of the development of the papacy, that, you know, that's when I became a, a bit, you know, had more question about that and you really right. do just right. see kind of historically how it changed um exactly. during during the time of the the dark ages the middle ages dark ages no loaded term there and in and in, in some ways i have sympathy with that because there was really a power vacuum that developed in the west and the papacy kind of stepped up to fill that vacuum there's a grain of truth to all this, but it's still irrelevant to the claim. Is the papacy of a divine institution? Not how did how did it circumstantially and historically organically unfold? Those are two separate things. One is the claim that Christ, if you will, deposited this seed into the ground. And the other is a description of how that seed grew into a tree. Those are two different things. I'm asking the question, did Jesus plant that seed? Did he or did he not? You're trying to engage the question of, well, how did the seed grow What's when it's in once once it is planted, right? You know, well, it was water, there was sunlight. Yeah, I know. Sure. You're just telling me how the papacy organically developed. You're not addressing the question, is it of a divine institution and in origin? Fundamentally different question. And I explicitly said that in the interview. And they even quoted that part. So it's very clear what I'm asking, but I'm not being engaged. And again, I don't think that they're just trying to not engage me. No, 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 no. I, I don't think that there's bad will. I just don't think that they have, number one, adequate uh, preparation to respond. Um, and then I don't think they're really grasping what I'm saying, the implications, the nuances, what I'm actually getting at. I think they have me confused with just your random convert who hasn't really thought through these things well. I've thought a whole lot more through these things than it, apparently it sounds like they have based on what I'm hearing from them. But I think right. the papacy ended up then becoming something, um, you know, that was a, a deviation from the right. spirit of the gospels from the right. spirit of the fathers and of course people are going to say the same thing about eastern orthodoxy with its venerations of icons the protestant is just going to say they deviated the blah 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 and now what is the orthodox going to do they're now going to come to a defense 
and give an apologetic for the um, for the place of iconography in the church. Right? They're going to now defend the Seventh Ecumenical Council. That's fine. That's all we're doing is we're now defending the claim that we're making about the papacy. That's that's all we're doing. So, I mean, these criticisms can can go both ways. Everybody can say, yeah, the papacy fell away from its its actual origins, just as the Protestant can claim the same about Eastern Orthodoxy with iconography. It doesn't make it true. Just because you say it doesn't make it true. And I need you to engage our actual claims and not the worst that we have to offer, the best that we have to offer the best material that's available out there for the claim that the papacy is of divine institution. That's what I need addressed. And until I hear that address, everything else is irrelevant to me. It goes in one ear out the other. It's irrelevant. It doesn't touch on my claims. So, um, yeah, yeah. I don't want you to go too far down that road. Cause we're yeah. going to get to the, the, Oh, and here it is big one for y'all evidence that at the very least the host did not watch my video and maybe he watched just like a couple minutes here and there to, and, and grabbed a couple questions. If he did watch the video, he's culpable then for what he says next and for the misrepresentations. So I'm going to assume he didn't watch it entirely. And maybe somebody else was preparing the points for him. He didn't see it. He was just said, well, Michael off said this interact with this. I'm assuming somebody else prepared this for him. Um, because if not, he's responsible for what he says next. Issue of the papacy and the questions. So Good, I asked you um, to cut me just, off, so thank you. <laughs> Y'all ready? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not doing that other than yeah. to say that you eventually, yeah. obviously, made the decision to come into the church. And yeah. um, then did you attend? Um, and somebody, by the way, Kyle, I see you there in the chat. Um, let me pull it up. Uh, is this a radio show? Uh, yeah, well, is it Orthodox? Yes. It's Ancient Faith Radio. So it's a Orthodox Radio Network, very, very well known. And they also have YouTube channel, books. It, it's kind of like Catholic Answers, but your Orthodox version of Catholic Answers. That That's exactly how I would describe it. Uh, there, there, to my knowledge, there's nothing, you know, larger than Ancient Faith Radio when it comes to a media presence for Eastern Orthodoxy. To my knowledge. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, so that, that's what it is. And one of the shows is um, Ancient Faith Today live with Father Tom Soroka. Okay. Now, here's, here's what they say. Orthodox Seminary? Uh, just, for, just for a year. Um, right. I, yeah, which is common when, when somebody's yeah. already attended. I was just curious there. Well, be, yeah, because yeah. I had those years at Catholic Seminary. I had a PhD. Of course. PhD, in theology, I mean, where I absolutely. where I'd study, did my dissertation under Orthodox priests too. At yeah, ah. in fact, that was what I invited uh, Father Latier on a while back was was to discuss his dissertation because I was looking through it, um, and I uh, I thought you know what this this would be fun to interact with. So um, I'm, I'm excited that he's going to be coming on now, again. Not sure what we're going to be talking about, but we'll we'll see. Interesting. So, Very good. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Father Daniel. Well, we're yeah. happy that you made that decision. And let's get right to the, um, the video is. and the claims made in the video. I want to remind our listeners, one eight five five af radio That's one eight five five two three seven two three four six. If you have a specific question that you'd like to ask Father Daniel, please feel free to call in. Or we're checking the um, threads of the various... Um, Facebook pages and or send us an email. We'll be happy to answer that. All right. So, Father Daniel, let's begin uh, about 30 minutes into the video. Basically, what Michael Lofton says, and I, I this one, I don't have a specific quote for him, but I'm summarizing what he said. He basically said that the reason that he had initially left Catholicism was because he had encountered bishops and teachers who had promoted ecumenism, scandals, liberalism. He was encountering scandals. That is not that they were promoting them, yeah. uh, that that there was liberalism in the church and that these bishops were soft on moral issues. But then when he became Orthodox, and I believe he was going to a church in Chicago area. 
going to a church in the Chicago area. <laughs> he didn't watch the video. <laughs> he definitely didn't watch the video, y'all. <laughs> and if he did, I then have to question his comprehension skills, which I don't think needs to be questioned because, I mean, he sounds sounds normal. I don't think that that's the case, right? I just think that he, he didn't watch the video. <laughs> There you go, y'all. Hey, uh, Chicago area, man. I I would like that. In fact, I want to come back to the Chicago area and um, and uh, visit some of y'all, meet y'all. Uh, let me know if there's an interest, and uh, I think we could do that. I was thinking about flying into Milwaukee, staying with uh, Stephen Augustine, good good friend, Catholic friend there, and uh, driving over to. Chicago as well, and uh, maybe just you know meet, meeting different people and um, seeing how that goes. And if there's a big interest, we could eventually do a conference or a reason a theology conference, and maybe in that area. So we'll we'll see how that goes. More to come. Yeah, Chicago area, y'all. That's that's where I was received into the Orthodox Church. Mm hmm. Well, let let me just say, if I were in the Chicago area, um. I wouldn't have ever converted to Eastern Orthodoxy because as I was noting, there were really no good parishes for me to go. It was impossible for me to go, uh, to continue to be Catholic just practically because of the situation I was in as far as the parishes that were available. Uh, there's some pretty good parishes in Chicago, so this wouldn't have even been an issue there. I won't talk about the jurisdiction. We'll just kind of leave that alone. I, I'm glad you didn't, but... You shouldn't have mentioned that one. <laughs> um, he said that he basically was encountering the same thing. Uh, he was encountering letters from the bishop that were promoting liberal issues. He was he he the the bishop was uh, having joint prayer services with the local Roman bishop. Uh, there was a financial scandal. There were you know and and as we know, there are various liberal Orthodox websites that are pushing a liberal agenda. So I, I guess the first question would be, is that um, a kind of a legitimate reason to say, hey, you know, what's the difference? Because I'm getting liberalism in the Catholic Church, I'm getting liberalism in the Orthodox Church. If I'm going to weigh both sides and I'm going to go Catholic, then I might as well just go Catholic. Is that exactly what I was saying? Not really. That's not what I was saying. If you go back and watch the video, that really wasn't the reason why I was addressing scandals in Catholicism and then scandals in Eastern Orthodoxy. Let me re-explain it. What I was effectively getting at, and mind you, maybe I just didn't explain it very well. I don't know. I'm dealing with a major war outside. <laughs> there was a major storm that I'm hearing that evidently the audio, thankfully, didn't reflect that much other than the lightning that almost killed me. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, I'm the whole time dealing with a really bad storm, and I'm extremely distracted. So I'm finding it very hard to remain focused. I did my best. I, I, I gave it my best shot. But man, it was frustrating. So maybe I just didn't explain this very well. Maybe he's just hearing what I said and misunderstanding it because of that. Let me re-explain. The reason why I brought up scandals in the Catholic Church and then Eastern Orthodoxy is this. Whenever you're dealing with the Catholic Church, you encounter all these scandals. Yeah, you're going to say, well, this is the Church of Christ. Where, where else are we going to go? Um, but sometimes you could be tempted to say, you know what? Um, if it's practically impossible for me to go to church, let, let's just, let's make up a scenario. Okay. Let's say there's only one Catholic church in town and the Catholic priest murders your children. Okay. And the bishop's okay with it. The priest isn't going to apologize. <laughs> the police don't care. Right. Nobody does anything. And the congregation supported the priest in the act. Okay. Horrible thing. Right. And I'm not saying that this actually occurs. I mean, if it does, it's outrageously rare, right? <clears throat> but I'm just throwing out a scenario so that we're clear. Let's say that happens, but the Catholic Church is the church established by Christ. You're going to be tempted to say, you know what? I can't go to Catholic, the Catholic Church anymore. 
Well, why? Because this is the only parish available. Well, but don't you know that the Catholic Church is established by Christ? Well, yeah, but the priest there murdered my son and my daughter, <laughs> right? Do you, do you see why the average person would, would struggle with that? Yeah, I believe the Catholic Church is established by Christ, but the only Catholic Church around me murdered my kids, and they're not going to do anything about it. Can, can you see why somebody might say, you know what, maybe I was wrong in my decisions here about the Catholic Church. Maybe I need to look at orthodoxy or Protestantism. Do you see why that happened? Right. Well, I went through a lot. I dealt with a lot, as I noted in, in the video. I didn't go into a whole lot of details, but I dealt with a lot. It's very easy for those things to scandalize you and for you to just say, you know what, maybe I made the wrong decision here. Maybe I, I don't see it intellectually, but practically I can't, I can't go back to the church, right? I can't, I just can't go there. It's, it's too much. It's too much. <clears throat> and you're going to consider looking elsewhere. And I had people who said, you know what, Michael, the fact that the, all that happened, that's God's way of practically showing you the Catholic church isn't the true church. I had Orthodox tell me this, that that's the, that's the God showing you in your circumstances. Maybe he doesn't give you the answers to your intellectual questions, but he's just showing you practically that the Catholic church is not for you. And the Orthodox church is. And when I get to the Orthodox church, I met with other scandals. And those scandals weren't as bad as the ones that I was met with, but that doesn't determine the truth, now does it? That was my point. I can't judge Catholicism on those scandals any more than I could now dismiss orthodoxy because I'm finding scandals there. I can't judge based on the issue of scandals. That's what I was getting at. You can't determine where the true church is based on scandals, bad liturgies, and things like that. Because that then means truth is determined by your circumstances. Is truth relative? No. Okay, so now we have to engage objective claims and not relative circumstantial claims, right? Right. That's what I was getting at. Maybe I didn't explain it very well. Also, you know, you're, you're in an interview. You don't know how long you can go on a particular question, so you want to be succinct and brief. And I did the best I could, struggling to even say anything and concentrate because of all of the distractions. Now, I'm used to a fair amount of distractions, so I can usually work my way through them. But, man, that was the most challenging show I've ever done. Not because of the platform, but because of that storm going on so i'm i'm gonna assume i didn't speak very well here and he just misunderstood me as to why i'm bringing up the question of scandals well yeah i i guess it depends what i mean how he's defining the terms but also you know i mean if he was leaving catholicism because he expected to come into the orthodox church and not find problems or that the scales right. would weigh and there would be fewer problems in the Orthodox Church right. than the Catholic Church. I mean, he might have been setting himself up for failure. Really? I mean, I agree somebody would be setting themselves up for failure if that were the case. But I mean, I, I think I made it abundantly clear that wasn't what was going on. So it just really makes me wonder, did, did they actually listen? I'm very disappointed that they think I'm the, that I'm this... Um, <laughs> you know, uh, unreflective, I guess, would be the term. I mean, I, I just, um, that I didn't really think through these things and, and test the consistency of the claims. I thought through that. I didn't come into Eastern Orthodoxy thinking there would be no scandals, there would be no problems. That, that wasn't what I was getting at. No. No. But the point was, since I'm encountering all this in the Catholic Church and it's practically impossible for me to go to a Catholic Church nearby, maybe that is God's providence demonstrating that Catholicism is wrong. Therefore, I look to the East, and yet I'm encountering some of the same problems. And so I can't say, <laughs> okay, well... Providence is showing me Eastern Orthodoxy is right because Providence is not showing me it's right. Providence is showing me it has the same problems, just as I had suspected.
Just as I had already thought, it's showing me. So nobody can say, Michael, you know, God's just proven to you that Catholicism is wrong. No, we can't go. We, we can't make decisions based on those claims. That's why whenever I hear these ridiculous apologists online who are, you know, toxic orthodox, who will go and make all these stupid arguments about, oh, well, Catholics have clown masses and all kinds of things like that. As if liturgical abuse, the presence of that, determines truth. So circumstances determines truth. Because there's plenty of circumstances where you can go to a good parish without liturgical abuses and without craziness in the liturgy. Does that make it, those guys true, but the other ones false? And is truth really relative? No. So that's rhetoric. That's just appealing to people's emotions. You got to get more objective, right? That's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to say that that's not going to work. That's not going to help me determine where the truth is. The fact that you have scandals, good liturgy, bad liturgy. No. What's going to determine the case, in my opinion, boils down to the papal claims. And that's an objective claim that needs to be examined. If it fails, don't waste your time with the orthodoxy. If it succeeds, you have to become... Uh, Catholic. I mean, if that was exactly. one of kind of the... I think I said don't waste your time with the Orthodoxy. I meant don't waste your time with the Catholic Church. ...principal criteria by which he made that jump, or if that was right. his hope, you know, right. I, you know, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I went, I mean, one of my difficulties with coming into the Orthodox Church, I'll say, was that in the Catholic Church, they kind of pride themselves on having every a nice tight ship of unity. Um, and, you know, <laughs> then I'm looking at the Orthodox Church as a Catholic and you've got overlapping jurisdiction. I don't care about that. I don't care that the Catholic Church looks more unified than the Orthodox. I don't care about that. That doesn't determine truth. If Christ gave us a disorganized church, so be it. Okay. If your church is organized based on an artificial mechanism, I'm not interested in it. So if the papacy that is the center of this unity is just artificial, I don't care that there's unity. It's a false unity, right? And just because Orthodox are disorganized in their ecclesiology doesn't mean they're not the true church. I'm not making these claims. Right. I, they're engaging somebody else. They're not engaging me. Um, that doesn't invalidate the Orthodox. What's going to determine which one is true is going to be which one has an objective claim to um, what was instituted by Christ. Right. You could say it would seem more fitting. It would seem more reasonable that you would have a papacy. You can make that argument. That's fine. But that's not going to be a silver bullet against the Orthodox. It's not going to be a silver bullet. You have to demonstrate the papacy is of a divine institution. You can't just use these really lowbrow arguments against the Orthodox and just say, man, y'all are disorganized. You can't be the Church of Christ. That, that's not good enough. That's a bad argument. It's not going to be consistent if you actually think about it. Uh, so I don't use these arguments. But for some reason, they're coming up in a review of my material. And, sure. you know, sometimes right. a squabble pops up. Um, yeah. So that, that was something to think. I mean, but for me, you know, I looked at the other things. I, I mm -hmm. you know, and the evidence weighed in favor of the Orthodox Church, which is just like a more coherent theology of the sacraments, mm. you know, the, the right. means by which we come to participate in Christ. And uh, I mean, the Oriental Orthodox can claim the same thing. The Syrian Church of the East can claim the same thing. The Eastern Catholics can claim the same thing. That's not going to determine truth. So here I, I have to respectfully disagree with Father I appreciate what he's saying that, yeah, our sacramentology <laughs> needs to be consistent. Yeah, we need to be uh, focused on piety and things like that and focus on prayer and fasting. And we need to develop those things well. Not that Catholics have it. Uh, there, there is somewhat of a bias there. But I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying, let, let's take him at his word here. I agree.
But that's not going to determine the truth because I have to still ask the same question for the Eastern Catholics, the Oriental Orthodox, and the Syrian Catholics, and some Anglicans who have valid orders. Okay, that's not good enough for me. And then, okay, let's just narrow it down to the Eastern Orthodox. Okay, which one now? Because we have a massive internal schism now, the Greeks and then the Russians. Which one do I go into communion with? And don't tell me that doesn't matter because it does for reasons why I mentioned on the show. And there's other ones. So <clears throat> that's not going to determine the truth for me. So that's actually a very bad argument to determine okay, I'm not going to be an Eastern Catholic priest anymore. I'm going to go Eastern Orthodox. I think the father made a mistake if he made that decision based on that, that argument. That's a, maybe you joined the right church, but for the wrong reason. And maybe the Orthodox are right. That's a true church, but you joined them for the wrong reason. That's not going to be good enough. That's not an objective claim. And it's not going to differentiate you from others who are in schism for, from your communion. And to become uh, divine, um, you know, just that they'd preserved really a mature ascetical tradition, um, not just mm. with fasting, but just with prayer, with just with the view of life, our faith life as one of ascent. You know, we're in the, you know, following the Sunday of the divine ladder. That I mean, can't we say the same about the Copts? You know, the Coptic Church has done a really good job at. Uh, you know, it's prayer life and it's fasting and, and uh, you know, things like that. Can't can we just. Just concept of ascent and spiritual life, you don't just don't find as much in the Catholic Church. So I, I was more looking at all those things, you know, and I wasn't as bothered by, um, you know, some of the uh you know hierarchical yeah I, I can tell and so he converted the eastern orthodoxy for not very good reasons um and again i'm not saying that he was wrong if eastern orthodoxy is right he converted to the right communion but he converted to them for the wrong reasons just like an orthodox who leaves orthodoxy and converts to catholicism because they feel that catholics never have any scandals you know, something ridiculous, right? Or they feel, better yet, they just feel that, or you know, Catholicism has a great uh, intellectual tradition, okay? You could say the same about some aspects of, you know, Orthodox history. You can say the same thing, Byzantine scholasticism and stuff like that. So that's not going to, that's not going to be an ultimate reason to leave Eastern Orthodoxy and become Catholic. You've converted to the Catholic Church for the wrong reason if you've done that. I'm just throwing out a wild example. Yeah, I mean, we, we could think of some others, right? Uh, the point is, I don't think this was a really objective reason. I think that was very, very subjective, and it doesn't differentiate itself from the Oriental Orthodox. So why didn't you become Oriental Orthodox, Father? I could ask you that question and, and just say, I mean, they, they have everything that you just said, right? Uh uh shenanigans you know yeah that that pop up i mean <laughs> right. but that's been with the church from the beginning i mean during the Arian exactly crisis, yeah most of the bishops right. in the world were Arian. you know yeah um, so yeah absolutely that doesn't help your case um uh yeah j just because there have always been you know issues with the hierarchy um in history that doesn't actually help your case uh, i hope you realize that when you make arguments like that you, you're going to actually make yourself look really bad to the protestants but i understand there's a grain of truth to what they're saying right i mean there have all there there have always been schisms and internal fights and problems and stuff like that this is why they didn't watch the video because i said that I said that I said there have already been I said you have a schism right now going on with uh, the Greeks and the Russians yet there have been many times where you've had the same problem in history and then thunder lightning struck immediately at that point when I said that right <laughs> because the point is there have been times in history there have been schisms in the history of the church, there have been bad bishops. There have been controversies. That goes without saying. I never said that that's a case against orthodoxy. What I did say after that was 
The problem is, once you have the schism, how are we going to fix it given the orthodox ecclesiologies? And since the schism of the orthodox is over a matter of ecclesiology, I don't see how it's able to resolve this issue. Now, you might just say, well, you don't see it intellectually, but the Holy Spirit will do it. I mean, the Protestants can say the same kind of stuff at this point. Mormons can say the same stuff. Well, it doesn't make sense intellectually, but we just got to trust the Holy Spirit's going to do it. Everybody can say that. Everyone can say that. You're just being irrational and, and, and using that to promote your position at that point. That's a bad argument. But what I, And then I went on to say the thing that could fix it and generally did fix these issues historically was the papacy. And in some cases, the emperor, right? Well, they don't have the emperor. And they don't have the pope. So what do we do? Yeah. Now, that's not to excuse bad behavior. It's not to excuse of course scandals. Not. No. Uh, but it's to say that, look, you know, uh, a human divine institution is not going to be perfect. And so either way. And the other thing that I wanted to say is just kind of for full disclosure, um, this particular video, which I already named, this particular point. is smoke pork ribs. I'm glad you're in the chat. You're the guy that they quote and misattributed to me. You use the term, and I'm going to come up to it later. Use the term that the Eastern Orthodox promote contraception. And I never said that. And they read that quote that you made and read it into me and said, Michael said this. And I would never use that term. And I know you probably just wrote it really quickly and we're thinking a whole lot about the terms. They latched on to the term that they promote contraception and we're just laughing about it. Ha ha ha. Like priests are out there just picketing and writing and, you know, signs promoting contraception. And they start to critique that as if it's something I said. And I never said that. <laughs> they read your super chat question of the Matt Frad. They quoted it and then they put it on my lips and then went to refute it as if they're engaging me. Um, so <laughs> and in fact, what I did do is I'm going to show in the video right afterwards, after you ask that question, I use the term they permit. I didn't say promote. I said permit. And that would be the more appropriate term if we're going to quibble over terms. Uh, so somebody says smoke pork ribs is in trouble. <laughs> No, <laughs> but, but smoke board ribs, they were quoting you and they applied it to me. Uh, I'll show it here in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I know you're writing quickly. You're not thinking of the ter the exact terms, how they're going to perceive them. I get that. I understand that. I, I, I'm not faulting you, but I am a little bit more careful with, with these terms because I realize I am thinking of those things. I am thinking, here's how they're going to perceive and interpret it. And I never said those things. They quoted you and then they applied it to me, which again showed me that they didn't even watch the interview because it's Matt Frad reading your quote and they said, Michael is saying this. <laughs> you can't do that if you watch the video. There's just no way. So it's clear they didn't watch my video. So the, what they're engaging, I don't, I don't know. You know, I think that what happens is they have some, you know, intern or something behind the scenes who's grabbing quotes from my interview and is passing it on to the host and say, you know, here's, here's what Michael said, you, you engage this, right? So I'm assuming Father Thomas didn't actually watch and all that. But here's the problem. When, when you don't, you know, actually watch the material, you're going to end up misrepresenting people. Now, some people are going to say, well, Michael, you do comedy hours and you don't even watch the video in advance. Right. Because the stuff that I'm in, you know, the stuff that I'm reviewing doesn't need <laughs> any kind of serious response. I mean, if I were if I were engaging someone's, you know, who actually deserved to give be given an answer, I'm going to watch their material once. I listened to their interview one time. I, I listened to this before I, I made these comments, you know. Um, I'm going to listen to it first, but on comedy hour and that kind of stuff, there's no need to prep. So that that's why you can do those impromptu. But I don't think that what I presented is just going to is that level. I think that you even though I know I'm giving very, very, very basics, very superficial material, 
painting with a broad brush, um, speaking very generally to just, you know, popular audience. I still think I gave enough substance in what I was saying that would deserve a fair engagement. I mean, is at minute 30, three zero. So let's just say that. All right, uh, Father Daniel, let's go on to the next one. Uh, this is at minute 33. And he says, Michael Lofton said, the Roman Catholic Church has a better claim to authority in the first millennium. As I continue to study the matter, I wasn't seeing it in favor of Eastern Orthodoxy. If the papacy is an institution established by Christ, Boom. Listen to what I just said. He's quoting me. If the papacy is an institution established by Christ, listen to that. Christ, and I'm not in communion with it, that's going to impact my relationship with Jesus. And then I think... Right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. If Jesus started a church, and you know it, and you refuse to be part of it... Don't you think that's going to cause a problem with you and Jesus? Don't, don't you think? Of course. So that's what I'm saying here. Now, it's an if. It's an if. And Catholics do make it a positive assertion. We do make that claim. We don't just put it as an if. I was just presenting it as, a, as an if. But we, we do actually make the claim that it is of divine institution. So now we have to substantiate that as Catholics. We, we can't just say, well, I mean, just believe it just because we say it. No. We have to substantiate that in the first millennium. Right? From scriptures and from tradition. All of that. Which... I believe we've done. I think that uh, that has been done sufficiently. <clears throat> the point, however, is I'm engaging objective truth claims here. If this is objectively true, if this is actually established by Christ, I don't have any other choice. That's what I'm getting at. Let's listen. I think he goes on to uh, quote uh, one of the uh, Roman Catholic ecumenical councils that basically says, you know, if you turn away from the Catholic faith after having known it, you'll lose your salvation. So, yeah, um, I mean, that, and that that statement is actually from uh, Vatican II. It's from a, a document called right. Lumen Gentium, which says, you know, only, you know, it says basically people can be saved even if they're not Catholic. The only people who are. It doesn't say if they're not Catholic. <clears throat> they may not formally be catholic that's the point that's the point if they're saved they are catholic they're informal members however are completely out are those who know who with certitude know the catholic church is the true church and don't join themselves to it now who those people are who know with an absolute certitude that the we never said it was an absolute certitude it's a moral certitude sir or father it's a moral certitude we never said, and the council never says, that you have to have an absolute certitude. Who has an absolute certitude about obje objective claims like this of a spiritual nature, right? Um, nobody's going to have an absolute certitude, the certainty of faith or something like that. Who, who cares about that? What we're saying is there's a moral certitude. That's what we're saying church is is the true church and don't join it i don't know who this he says he doesn't know who they are irrelevant irrelevant god would know who they are and that's what the council is getting at it doesn't it's not up to you and i to determine who these people are it's just up to god and that's all the council's addressing category of people is but you know and and father don't you believe that yourself i mean you it sounded like later on in the video you kind of believe the same thing i mean it sounds like he doesn't automatically condemn all non-formal card carrying eastern orthodox members uh to the flames of hell so you recognize that there's a little bit of nuance that needs to be made here and that's what the council's doing okay but you're gonna say at some point somebody's culpable for not entering the orthodox church right yeah yeah you're gonna say that i'm sure you would Okay, well, at what point are they culpable? 
That's what the council's answering. <clears throat> I, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, but um, yeah. So, so in terms of, of the idea of the papacy, um, you know, as an institution established by Christ, actually, you were going into that topic uh, when you were talking about your, your conversion story. So let's examine that just a little bit. What's your take on the idea of you look at the papacy in the year 2021 and you see what it is. And I mean, maybe the height of the power of the papacy was, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. But but today it's still obviously a significant force. Uh, it, he is the bishop of bishops. He has direct jurisdiction over every single Roman Catholic. Um, is do do we as orthodox christians see a disconnect between the papacy that is the bishop of rome in the first millennium and what we see today <laughs> yeah the answer is of course you do see a disconnect um so in a minute we're going to see why you see a disconnect and i'm going to then show you why it's a bad argument um but <clears throat> Isn't it the case that Protestants would see a disconnect between the patriarch and the synod and the way in which the bishop conducts himself when it comes to the relationship of priests and, you know, particular congregations and things like that? Aren't they going to see a disconnect between that and the Bible? Hmm. Think so? And by the way, who uh, who needs to be modded in the chat? I see some mod uh, appeals for help there in the mod uh, area. So just let me know who needs to be modded. Um, do my best to keep an eye on that and we'll do this at the same time. It's a little bit of a um, little bit of a challenge, but um, yeah. Protestants are going to see a big disconnect between the patriarch, the way the synod works in Eastern Orthodoxy, the local bishop, and his distinction from the presbyter and his relationship to the presbyter. They're going to see a disconnect between that and the first century, the second century, uh, especially when it comes to patriarchs. You can make a claim, of course, from Ignatius of the local bishop, but patriarchs and stuff like that we know is, is going to be a later development. Um, <clears throat> they're going to see a disconnect there, right? Mm -hmm. Right, but that doesn't mean that the Orthodox are wrong in their claims about the episcopate and even the role of a patriarch or a synod. It doesn't mean that the Orthodox are wrong. They, they could have very good arguments in favor of them, right? Just because somebody sees a disconnect in the first millennium doesn't really settle the problem. And we're going to now find out why they see the disconnect. And then I'm going to offer a response and show why it's a really bad argument. And I'm then going to show you why I'm even discouraged even more when I hear this, because it just confirms to me that you're not going to get a very serious level of engagement. All right, let's listen. Well, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you look at our, our church, there's more kind of a, a decentralized character to it, you know, because I mean, our ecclesiology. And that's fun. If Christ gave us an ecclesiology that is decentralized, I'm cool with it. <laughs> right. I'm fine with whatever Jesus gave us. That's fine. It might not be the most fitting, but God always doesn't, doesn't always do what is the most fitting, right? Sometimes he does. Sometimes he doesn't. He might have other reasons why he, in this particular case, doesn't do what's most fitting to bring about something that is more fitting elsewhere, right? Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't have a problem, ultimately speaking, with a more decentralized um, ecclesiology. But the question is, what did Jesus actually give us? That's what's going to settle the issue for me. Theology is rooted really in liturgy, you know, like that, the title of that Bishop John Zazula's book, Bishop Eucharist Church, you know. Right, 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 right. So, yeah, uh, th there's a whole lot of truth to the idea 
behind what Zizoulis is saying. There's a whole lot of truth behind the idea that we really need to see the local church as the church. Okay. We need to stop thinking of the church as just something that's centered in Rome. And then there's a bunch of little subsidiaries here and there spread throughout the world. Stop thinking of the church that way. There's a grain of truth, a grain of truth to the idea that there's a sinner here in Rome. There's a grain of truth to all that. But we really need to recapture as Catholics the understanding of the local diocese being the church. And we could even say the fullness of the church for those who are in communion with Rome. And in fact, the Catholic church does even say that. I just read that to y'all two days ago in another video. Just read it to y'all where the church actually speaks about the local church being the universal church there um, on the on the local level. It has the fullness, right? But again, this is for local churches that are in communion with Rome, as opposed to local churches that have valid orders that are not in communion with Rome. We would have to say they are lacking something. They're lacking something. They are lacking a universality at that point. <clears throat> Just as an Orthodox who would recognize the orders of the Oriental Orthodox would have to still say that the Oriental Orthodox are lacking something. Now, you're going to have different Orthodox who land differently on this issue, but I'm speaking only to those Orthodox who recognize the validity of orders outside of canonical Orthodoxy, right? They're lacking something, right? Even though they have everything on the local level, right? They're lacking something. This is our position. What they're lacking is universality when they're not in communion with the Pope. But that still doesn't mean then that the local church that is in communion with the Pope is just some little tiny uh, portion and some little tiny um, part of the big universal church. We're not saying all these local dioceses are just little bitty pieces and you add them all together and they make the big one thing. That's not Catholic ecclesiology. No. So that each local church headed by the bishop is an image of, you know, the universal church, the church in its fullness. Kind of the um, Ignatian model. Hmm? <laughs> uh, no, that, that's not exactly the Ignatian model, but I don't have a problem with what, what is said there. Catholics don't have a problem with that ecclesiology. Officially speaking, I know you got some random people out there who would say all kinds of things. I'm, I'm just talking about Catholicism, objectively speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we we look back and you, you can't see that in really the first millennium, um, you know, and it, it really was. Can't see what in the first millennium? Toward the end of the first millennium you know with the rise of kind of the frankish empire here we go with the frankish empire argument against the Catholics. is when i ever hear this I, when i hear this i honestly have to roll my eyes and no disrespect to father but i'm just talking about the the material itself i just have to roll my eyes are you kidding me uh, come on stop because our claims predate the rise of the frankish empire that that's the problem so just, just stop. Stop talking about the Frank. Stop. It's irrelevant. They could have never existed. We were already making these claims way, way before the Franks. So now you have to ask the question, were these claims that the popes were making and others were making, are they true? I don't care what happens with the Franks that maybe develops the papacy even further. We've already spoken about the difference between how the church and its ecclesiology developed and what's actually planted by Christ. We would say that, for example, when it comes to iconography, we would both agree, Eastern Orthodox and Catholics, we would both agree. Well, some of y'all Orthodox wouldn't agree, but uh, <clears throat> some of the more reasonable Orthodox would agree that, you know, St. Paul wasn't going around, um, you know, uh, bowing down to icon icons. Okay, I, I know there's some Orthodox who would maintain that view, but mo the more reasonable Orthodox would maintain that. But that doesn't make iconography wrong or not dogmatic, and it doesn't even mean they're not apostolic. They are apostolic substantially, 
Okay, but the development, the organic growth to it accidentally is something that took place over time. But the substantial points that develops into iconography and the veneration of icons are the apostolic. So it's going to necessarily organically grow into that. So we can say it's apostolic and yet not have to say that, yeah, St. Paul was actually sitting there, you know, bowing down to an icon. <clears throat> and this is just one example. I could give some others. Even if St. Paul was actually doing this, I would just give you a different example. So we recognize that, right? I want us to keep that in mind as we listen. And Charlemagne and their kind of disputes with the East. He's going into the Franks. He's going into Charlemagne. He's talking about now the development of the papacy. We can now then talk about the development of iconography. That doesn't mean that the apostles didn't give to us substantially the very things that developed into the veneration of icon iconography. Okay, so you could talk about through the unfolding of this and this and this and that happened, this happened, this happened to the empire, this happened with the Franks, the papacy developed into what it is. That's fine. That's cool. But the question still is, when you say it's developing into this, or at least that's what we would claim, um, was it actually planted? <laughs> was that actually deposited by Jesus and the apostles? Substantially. We would claim yes. And now, since we make that claim, we have to back it up historically. All right. I recognize that. You know, that you really see the, the Pope thrust more into this um, role of power. That's exactly the argument that Protestants use against the Episcopate. That's also the argument that Jerome uses for the Episcopate. Jerome is basically going to say the episcopate, episcopate developed out of the fact that there's all kinds of fighting going on, so it was proper for one to be an authority over the other. Um, so, I mean, Protestants, for example, especially, are going to use that argument against you. <clears throat> well, because this happened, now you have a monarchical episcopate instead of a plurality of elders. And because of this and that, and because of this, you now have this view of the Eucharist. And because of that, you now have this view of the liturgy. And because of this, you know, but I don't, I don't care. Did, did Jesus give it to us? Did the apostles give this to us substantially? That's what, that's where we need to focus on. Now, I mean, I think as Orthodox, you know, a, a serious Orthodox will admit the principle of papal primacy. You know, I... I will you? <laughs> some of y'all aren't doing it right now, I'm just saying. And then some of y'all will admit it and then impose it on to the Patriarch of Constantinople. And then he actually goes to use it. And then other people call and accuse him of being a Pope and then deny this universal primacy. Um, didn't, didn't I just do a show where I went over, uh, Archbishop? Uh, I don't know if I did that one. Yeah, I don't think I did that show yet. I'm going to go over, uh, the Archbishop of America who is going to, uh, what is it? El Pidophoros. I forget how to pronounce it. Um, <clears throat> Greek guy. I'm going to go over his article where he's criti criticizing the Russians for denying a universal primacy. Uh, that's his claim. Now, you might say, well, no, 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 the Orthodox, the Russians are going to affirm it here. Well, I'm just, just saying this is being debated among your own, and he's making that claim, and then he shows how that is applying then to the Patriarch of Constantinople and, and is behind some of the, these issues with the schism between the Greeks and the Russians. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not sure Well, you, you say that you accept, you know, this kind of primacy at the universal level. Okay. You might, the Orthodox church in America in theory might, uh, but there's going to be some of y'all who don't. And that, that's why I speak of Orthodox ecclesiologies. And then they're going to come back and say, well, you know what? There's Catholics who say this and there's Catholics who say that. I understand that. 
But the difference is we actually have a magisterial position on what the ecclesiology should be, and the others are dissenting from it or are ignorant of it. Whereas y'all actually don't have a formal position on uh, ecclesiology when it comes to the universal level. Some have tried to maintain arguments that would say y'all do, but I don't know. Seems unclear if y'all actually do. I think, you know, based on the ecumenical councils, we have to do that. And I think, you know, tell that the Russians. Yeah. How, uh, how can you, you just summarize what we would understand to be papal primacy um, in the undivided church? Something that's transferable. <laughs> uh, well, the, the how uh, we in, would in phrase, ten words phrase that is kind of difficult. <laughs> yeah. You know, because they're, you know, it's very much a point under discussion. Right. But that. Thank you for proving my point. Y'all are still discussing fundamental aspects of ecclesiology. That's my problem. 2,000 years later. I don't have a problem with that in the year 200 AD. I have a problem with that in the year 2021 AD. Y'all are still talking about the very basics of the faith, the very basics of ecclesiology. Y'all are still talking about how to receive converts, the very basics of stuff that has already been settled a long time ago. Y'all are still fighting over the most basic stuff when it comes to the theology. Now, you might say, well, Catholics are fighting all over all kinds of basic things. They're doing so dissenting from the actual official position of our magisterium. That's the difference. Y'all don't have an official position. That's the problem. That's the problem. There's a difference between a dissenter and somebody who actually doesn't have a position, right? Uh, there, there is no official position, so they just offer their own opinion. So there's a difference then between an opinion and a dissenter. That's the difference between orthodoxy and Catholicism. Uh, yeah. You know, that the Pope had a um, primacy of honor, you know, that they had a special role maybe. Yeah, the, the same regurgitated arguments so that you hear all the time. Um, and again, no disrespect to Father. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying I'm sick of hearing the most basic arguments. It's, it's like whenever you engage the Protestants and you hear the most ridiculous things like Orthodox worship idols. And, it, and, and it's just, you've never looked at Orthodoxy. You don't know what you're talking about. If you're a Protestant accusing Orthodox of worshiping idols, you, you've been dismissed from the discussion. You shouldn't be taken seriously. And when I hear this kind of stuff of, it's just the primacy of honor, it's just, mm, 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 okay. And uh, calling ecumenical councils, mm -hmm. um, whether, you know, but that's a question whether that particular role in the first millennium would apply still. Calling ecumenical councils? Boy, that's going to raise a lot of problems. Uh, Orthodox are going to be pretty divided on who gets to call an ecumenical council. Now, um, that the papacy was particularly known for its orthodoxy um, in the, Absolutely. in you know, those first centuries, you know, in those right. years, of the first seven ecumenical councils, um, you know. But it, interestingly, you know, Rome's primacy was, here we go. Based at the time of the ecumenical councils, uh, was based in Rome's position in the empire. There you go. You heard it. Rome's position was based on its position in the um, empire. There it goes. The empire argument. Hmm. It's it's hard for me to take this seriously. But I'm, I'm going to because I know that Father, you know, was sincere when he said it. So I'll, I'll, I'll address it. But this is the kind of stuff when I hear, I just think, wow, um, this is why I feel like my, my questions aren't being answered. Because from fathers to theologians to bishops, I'm getting the same nonsense. Here's why this is a really bad argument. First of all, is he talking about Chalcedon or Constantinople I? I don't know, but really irrelevant because Chalcedon, right? Canon 28 that makes this argument, and there's a grain of truth to it, right? There, there's a grain of truth to, um, I, I don't take this idea that 
you know, Rome's position in the empire had nothing to do with Rome's organic development. No, 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 no. It did. It did. Some truth to that. Uh, the fact that you have Peter and Paul martyred there, you have a lot of early popes that are saints who are martyred. That's going to give some prominence to Rome's position, right? Um, that's going to help. And that's also going to affect this organic growth. Still doesn't address the question, however, does it also have a claim to being a divine institution? You're just still talking to me about development. If you're going to claim that Rome's claims to primacy are entirely based on Peter and Paul were martyred there. You got a lot of saints uh, who were martyred, like, you know, early bishops. A lot of them were Orthodox. And their position in the empire. If that is the, those are the only reasons for the Catholic position of primacy, then you would say, okay, this is, first of all, something that could be transferable, right? And there, there goes Constantinople, right? It, uh, be, <laughs> because they're, they're making their claims saying that this now honor can be also shared by Constantinople. But then if Rome goes into heresy, it's now being, you know, administered, if you will, by Constantinople. But then Constantinople is not really that popular now in the empire we don't even have an empire so then russia comes along and then russia doesn't even have an empire anymore so uh, who, who has the primacy now well you know which which everyone's older on the diptychs and blah 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 okay here's the thing though even though there's a grain of truth to this impacted the development of the papacy and even some popes have admitted that this helped bolster its claims I don't have a problem with that personally. What I'm interested in is that the only reason why the papacy, are those the only reasons why the papacy has the primacy? If so, Roman Catholicism is false. I wouldn't waste time on it then. If not, then this is a horrible argument. You have to ask the question, Yes, all of that may be true to its organic development, and that may have helped its claims. But does it actually have a claim to having been divinely established as well? Now, this was, you have Chalcedon, Canon 28, doing this, 451, and it's interesting that Leo rejects the canon. And he does so by his apostolic authority from St. Peter. He overturns an ecumenical council. It's going to cause some problems for you, especially when you read Anatolius' response. I mean, I'm just saying uh, that doesn't look very good for the Orthodox. But let's just brush that to the side because I'm more concerned about what happens in 382 in light of what's going on in 381. Let me explain. In 381 at Constantinople 1, you have Canon 6 effectively making that claim. Right, effectively making that claim of, you know, Rome has this primacy due to its position in the empire. Therefore, Constantinople should have second. You effectively have that being said in Canon 6. Guess what? Canon 6 wasn't even received in Rome. You go and look up our canons right now. And in some of our lists, you'll notice there is no Canon 6. Why? Because Rome never accepted Canon 6. More importantly than the fact that we never received that canon and accepted it, more importantly, what happens in 382, one year after some try to push that canon? You have a pope, Damasus, who's a saint in the Orthodox Church, who says this. Likewise, it is decreed the Holy Roman Church has been placed at the forefront not by the conciliar decisions of other churches. Not by the decision, conciliar decisions of other churches. He's saying this right after 381. He's saying it's not by that. This is your, your saint saying this. But has received the primacy, where from? 
by the evangelic voice of our Lord and Savior. <laughs> He's saying that Rome doesn't have this primacy because of a position in the empire, some conciliar decision of blah, 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 blah. That might be helpful. It might bolster its claims. It might be helpful when it comes to organically developing the papacy, but that's ultimately not where our claim comes from. It comes from our Lord, a divine institution, which is why I always bring y'all back to the claim. Is it or the question, is it of divine institution? He says, by the evangelic voice of our Lord and Savior, who says, where does he get this from? Where did Jesus say? You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The first C, therefore, is that of Peter the apostle, that of the Roman church, which has neither stain nor blemish nor anything like it. The decree of Damascus. 382. Please talk to me about, you know, Canon 6 and the position of Rome in the empire when your saint literally one year later tells you otherwise. And it's not like this is the only guy, right? <laughs> if all you had was one saint saying this, I would say, well, yeah, that's not good enough for me. Just one saint saying something, eh, doesn't overturn, you know, a, a canon or something, you know, that, I would say it's interesting, but that's not going to carry the decision. But when you got others who are confirming it and more and more and more and more and more appealing to a divine institution and divine origin and their saints in your church, that's something else. When you have a whole aggregate of them for a long period of time, not just unique to one little tiny Period, you know, time frame or something, but through a whole span of years, centuries, making these claims. And yeah, some were in opposition to them, of course, just like some were in opposition to uh, Jesus being consubstantial with the Father. The problem is that we encounter all of these different popes and other saints who are making these claims and they're not just saying it's because we got a whole lot of martyrs or we ha have this position in the empire or this canon says this. They're rooting their claims in Matthew 16 and other scriptures from our Lord and they're saying it's of a divine institution. So now my question is, is that divine institution transferable? First of all, you don't believe in it. As, a, as far as a divine institution, you, you don't even believe that. So already you got a problem with a lot of your saints who are going to tell you differently. Moreover, even if you were to say, okay, you know what? I accept what the saints are saying. It is of a divine institution. I just believe it's been transferred from Rome to Constantinople because Rome's in heresy. Where do they teach the transferability of this primacy is my question. But that sounds like a, that's a really novel position. <laughs> but aside from the novelty here, it also goes against other things that these popes are saying, that they would see an indefectibility to its teaching authority. Um, and a non-transferability, a uniqueness to these claims to St. Peter and these promises that are made. Yeah, there's a whole lot of truth to the idea that every bishop has a claim to St. Peter, right? And every bishop is St. Peter in their diocese. That doesn't mean there's not a unique claim that Rome can make to St. Peter. Okay. And that's not me making that distinction. There are popes making that distinction in the first millennium. Here's what I would do if I were you, Mr. Orthodox. I'm not talking to the, the priests at this point. I'm, I'm just talking about if you're Orthodox and you're watching. Here's what I would do if I were you. <clears throat> what I would do is I would say, yeah, the, some of these popes made these claims. And they, I, they, they said that, um, you know, it was of a divine institution. But, you know, some... Some saints make mistakes and, uh, you know, it was it was in dispute at some point. And, uh, you know, some some of the saints tolerated this view and, you know, maybe not didn't speak against it. They just tolerated it. But it just became 
intolerable at one point. And, uh, you know, Rome just went too far at one point. And so these claims had to eventually be addressed and they were then rejected by the church. It would be better to argue that if you were Orthodox, I would, I would, I would respect your position a little bit more, but when you offer me this stuff, I just, I have to think you haven't even tried. You didn't even bother to look into this really. You, you didn't even try. We're aware of Canon 28. We're aware of your Canon 6. We're aware of some of these things that are being said and some of the arguments that are going on in ecclesiology. And we're aware that there are some who would even fundamentally reject the Catholic understanding of ecclesiology in the first millennium. We're aware of that. We're aware of that. So what? It doesn't take away from the fact that you got saint after saint after saint and pope after pope after pope making all kinds of claims that you don't believe. So what, what do we do with that? How do you avoid novelty in your ecclesiology? Those are my questions. Um, I, I, I think that has to be, that has to be underlined, highlighted, red yeah. circle. I, I don't think there's any way to get around that. This is a big deal for Father Thomas. He just thinks that, oh man, Canon 6 and Canon 28, those just have to be highlighted and red circled and everything. That just proves that the papacy is just this, you know, political institution. It doesn't really have any kind of divine claim because, you know, this canon said it from an ecumenical council that was rejected by a pope at that time and many popes afterwards. Um, putting that to the side, this canon just absolutely refutes Rome. I would say what those canons are doing is they are emphasizing again this idea that Rome has a primacy because of this political aspect. And I'm sure some who are promoting those canons believed those were the only reasons why Rome had a primacy. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, that doesn't mean everybody who promoted it believed those were the only claims uh, Rome could make for primacy. Moreover, the fact that they weren't received and they were rejected, and in fact, popes were saying the exact opposite and were opposing that, as we just saw with Pope Damasus, should make you think, hmm, maybe this isn't a silver bullet against the Catholics as I thought it was. And maybe it shouldn't be highlighted and underlined and red circled and whatever else we said there. If you look at the wording of the canon, it says because it is the, you know, the, the, the capital of the empire. Uh, and then yeah. it refers to Constantinople, right? To say now Constantinople is the new Rome because it is the capital of the empire. I mean, there has to be the idea of the connection of Rome as the, the center of the empire. And that's why it's, it's has the primacy and not just because of Peter, et cetera, et cetera. Wouldn't you agree? Well, and, and well, absolutely. And I mean, really also the the reverence due to rome of christians in the first few centuries was not necessarily because this was viewed as the see of the first pope you know there's still a question of whether peter was actually the first bishop pope. of rome you know right, that's not a right. that's not a certitude it was because the relics of peter and paul Somebody, somebody said I was, I was mute. I apologize. He, he says here, and I appreciate y'all let, let me know, by the way. He says here that the claim is effectively the case that, um, <laughs> somebody said Michael Lofton looks angry. I probably do. <laughs> no, I, I'm not angry. <laughs> Sound cut out without hands. Nice. <laughs> All right. Back to what he was saying, though. He's saying here that, Rome was making these claims, but early on, these claims were about Peter and Paul, right? That's what we just heard. And there's there's a whole lot of truth to, yeah, I mean, that de definitely helped bolster the claims of Rome. 
that wasn't the only reasons, but it definitely helped bolster the claims. Sure. But what did we just read from Pope Damasus? What did we just read from him? We just read him. He didn't say the primacy of Rome is based on the words of our Lord that says, you are Peter and Paul, and on these rocks I will build my church. He didn't say that, did he? Pope Damasus says the claim is based on Jesus who says, you are Peter in on this rock. Here he's rooting it in Peter. Yes, we can talk about Paul helping bolster the claim, sure. But ultimately, the claim is on Peter. Not just Peter and Paul. So you can't just say it can all be explained from a conciliar decision because we just see millions of reasons why that's not the case. You can't say it's just because on the empire, because again, we're saying, no, it's also based on the words of Jesus. You can't say it's because Peter and Paul were martyred there. That helps, but that's not the ultimate reason because we just saw it's not because you are Peter and Paul and on these rocks, it says you are Peter and on this rock, they're appealing to Peter. They're saying this is of a divine institution, a divine origin. And then they say more about it. They say more about it than just that. A whole lot more about it. We start adding all of it up after a while. It's just like, man, um, the, <laughs> what, there, there's clearly a theme here taking place. And there's some who are dissenting from it in the first millennium, sure. But there's clearly a, a consistent theme here, especially being made by the popes, but some saints some aspects of the councils too there's definitely a theme going on and upon what basis am i going to reject the words of saint after saint after saint after saint after saint but then i'm gonna say you know what i believe in venerating icons because john of damascus said this and maybe like one or two other fathers said this against this father said this, this father said no images, this father was against images, this father was against images, this father was against images. You're going to make a claim for iconography based on a handful of saints, but then you're going to reject a huge amount of saints on the papacy. I... I need, I want, I want to see some consistency and I'm saying more consistency when it comes to the Catholic claims in this area than, than the Orthodox. So, all right, let's, uh, move on. Let's go to, uh, the 3430 mark. And this is going to be where they have a caller who calls in and, um, <clears throat> He raises an interesting question. Let's hear it. Oh, you can't have what you're doing anymore. You are all Latins. Um, and, and maybe I, I should rewind that. I, I could explain, but let, let me first rewind him. At any time in theory, the Pope could say, oh, you can't have what you're doing anymore. You are all Latins. What, what he's saying is, look, when it comes to Catholicism, you got these Eastern Catholic churches. And if the claims of the papacy are true, you could have a pope who comes to the Eastern Catholic Church and says, look, you're not Eastern Catholic anymore. You're all Latins. And he could do that. That's what this caller is saying. And they're kind of going with it. Even, even though that could not be said. That could not be said. <clears throat> And it's very disappointing to hear these kinds of, you know, lowbrow arguments against the Catholic Church being given quarter by the show, because they don't they they don't give a whole lot of pushback on that one. They they somewhat affirm it. I found that a little bit troubling and biased. More importantly, let's go to three thirty nine. Uh, oh, five ish mark. Another caller, I think it's actually the same caller, but they they just you know ask them another question. Give them, um, you know, like the Pope, the Catholic Church in theory, or at least the hierarchy, tell 
Orthodox, they are wrong, and then go to the Muslims and give them, um, you know, like the Pope, uh, it's rumored he went to a mosque. and <laughs> This is just really bad arguments. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just saying, be, be consistent. Um, so what he's saying is that, all right, well, you got the Pope who's saying the Orthodox are wrong, but then he goes and loves on all these Muslims in their masks. <laughs> the Blue Mosque, you know, he goes and prays in the Blue Mosque or whatever. So he has all these love fests with the, the Muslims, but then he wants to tell the Eastern Orthodox that they're wrong. <laughs> this, is, this is the argument being used by the caller that they didn't really sufficiently correct. Um, here's my point that I want to bring out here. If the caller were consistent, he would ask the question, why is it that at a lot of these ecumenical powwows <laughs> and a lot of these interfaith events, my bishops are there and my patriarchs are there and they're participating in it? Why is that? I guess he didn't really think that went through. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, I mean, look, everybody wants to get on to Pope Francis and the Catholics for these interfaith stuff. And yeah, a lot of it's nonsense and, and does deserve criticism. Absolutely. For sure. But then just pay attention. There's usually Orthodox there present too, doing the same thing. Oh, but it's not the same. You're post supposed to be infallible irrelevant because in the first millennium being in communion and sharing in communion with a heretic is a problem right which is why you have those orthodox some of the orthodox who just say well you know what i gotta join the true orthodox i gotta leave world orthodoxy i might have to go and do the divine liturgy in a trailer or a strip mall, but I gotta, I gotta abandon these world Orthodox churches because they're participating in all this ecumenical interfaith worship, and uh, it's wrong and it's against the canons. And my the patriarch's a heretic, so I gotta join the true remnant of Orthodox out there, and that's where you get the true Orthodox. So I, I'm just saying that this questioner, he's, he's going to be in for a surprise when he finds out that, uh, yeah, well, you know what, um, your, a lot of your bishops are doing this and they're right there with the Pope. And in fact, they love Pope Francis too. So <laughs> what do you do with that one? I mean, there, there's quite a few Orthodox out there who just think Pope Francis is the best thing ever. Um, that's going to make some people who have the mentality of this questioner uncomfortable. And then they end up true Orthodox and leaving canonical Orthodoxy. And after that, they end up, you know, basically either staying there or going elsewhere. They see the folly in it and so on. Kiss the Quran and told people, oh, you don't have to be Christian to go to heaven, and all this other stuff, of course. So that doesn't happen in orthodoxy, right? Never happens in orthodoxy. Oh, but our patriarchs aren't infallible. You don't understand. But I do understand the principle in the first millennium that you don't communicate with heretics and schismatics, right? But you're in communion with these bishops who are doing the same stuff, so... What do you do now? Which is something I brought up during the uh, show. <clears throat> um, one can't read what's in people's hearts. I'm not talking about that. But in the Bible, it does say that by no other name, the name of Jesus, is anyone to be saved. And mm -hmm. um, now what God does with the Muslims who don't know any better, that's God's business. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let Well, now it sounds like you're making... Catholic distinctions. I'm just saying. Now you sound like Vatican too. You're you're starting to make some distinctions here when it comes to the Muslims, right? I mean, you're not just saying all oh, Muslims indiscriminately are going to hell now, right? I mean, you, you you backed away from that view, and now you're just kind of, well, I mean, we don't know, right? I mean, but is it that kind of the thing that we're doing is making distinctions and stuff like that? Aren't, aren't we kind of saying the same thing? 
Ah, uh, okay. Let's address so, your question. Go ahead, Father Daniel. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, in, in terms of, I mean, that's just a tough question. An ongoing kind of theological debate is, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, who can be saved, who can't, you know, the ecle proper ecclesiology. I, I would say, I would say in the Second Vatican Council, there was a document called Nostra Aetate on. Bless Father. He, um, I know he spent some time as a Catholic, but he, he should know better than this one. It's not Nostra Aetate. And I, I did a whole show recently on Nostra Aetate, as y'all already know. But yeah, it's not Nostra Aetate that he's referring to. He's referring to Lumen Gentium, which I also did an entire lecture dealing with Lumen Gentium, 14 through 16. And I also addressed that recently on uh, Tim Gordon's show. Been plenty of shows where we've object, uh, answered some of these objections that he's going to bring up here. But he's not even citing the correct document. And that's okay. That happens whenever you're speaking uh, extemporaneously. Sometimes you just misattribute things. Okay. I, I get it. That That's fine. Um, but it's not just a miscitation. It's a misunderstanding of what's going on. And that's what really concerns me. It's a misunderstanding of what's going on at Vatican II, which tells me that Father had some bad misunderstandings about the post-conciliar church. And that's why I spent a lot of time, a lot of time dealing with the Second Vatican Council and reactionary claims of traditional Catholics, because you have people like Father who hear all this stuff and they buy it hook, line, and sinker, and they don't really have a whole lot of preparation and responses to it and they just kind of go with it and yeah I, I think that's not very helpful so that's why we spend a lot of time correcting some of these misunderstandings here's one of them you know the place of other religions and, and i think it, it wasn't really a well-worded document it caused a lot of oh, okay well let's cast it on well-worded <laughs> i'm just saying uh what there. There's some things that weren't very well worded now, even when it comes to Orthodox councils, right? I mean, we, we can go to Metropolitan Hilarion's, uh, Alfayev's, um, article where he's going over, um, ecumenical councils and how to identify them and read kind of towards the end of the article in the paper where he's giving you discrepancies in the ecumenical councils and he's telling you of some problems in ecumenical councils and some of the things that weren't worded the best in ecumenical councils and he's talking he's talking about their ecumenical councils right the first seven right which we share with them but he's he's talking specifically about ecumenical councils that orthodox accept Let, let's apply that argument consistently which I've noted a million times right on this show, right? Because I've heard this kind of stuff. I've thought these arguments myself before. So I, I think it's important that we address the counter arguments as well. The confusion, there wasn't really much of an evangelical impetus in it because it's saying, you know, hey, like. No, not exactly. I mean, again, as I noted, um, it does make some qualifications in there. And again, Nostra Aetate has to be read in light of Lumen Gentium. As I showed previously, I think that was yesterday, right? The 1985 Extraordinary Synod of Bishops on Vatican II. Didn't I do that yesterday or the day before or something like that? We just went over that. You read Nostra Aetate and some of the lower documents in light of the more major documents like Lumen Gentium, which does definitely have uh, much more of a missionary purpose. If you look at the very end of Lumen Gentium 16, for example, it's saying most people are not in this invincible ignorance state. Most people are not in these things that we just described in paragraph 15. And that was after what it said in paragraph 14, which is extremely traditional. It talks about the necessity of Christ, the church, baptism, all that. That there's only one church, stuff like that. <clears throat> but at the end of paragraph 16, it's very careful to note most people don't fall into this category. Therefore, we need to go out and evangelize people and preach the gospel to them. Why didn't Father tell him that? Maybe because he's not very familiar with Vatican II. The Muslims and, and us, we share the same God, you know. Is is that just, that's all it says. The Muslim, well, we share the same God. Uh, well, you... <laughs> um, 
consult some of your own Orthodox bishops, Father, and uh, you, you, you might be surprised in some of the things they say. Uh, but again, you're going to say, well, you know, some of our Orthodox bishops are wrong and blah, blah, blah. Okay, consult some of your saints. Consult some of your saints. John of Damascus, right? We, we all know it's a Christian heresy. So there's then, uh, talking about Islam, so there's then a sense in which you could then speak about them worshiping the one God, but not salvifically in a heretical sense, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you, you could say the same thing of, of schismatics and certain heretics, right? But that doesn't mean that they're A-OK -okay and everybody's going to heaven. And that's kind of the impression that Father's given his listeners who don't really know what's going on with Vatican II and what it's really trying to get at. They're going to walk away thinking, oh, wow, Vatican II is saying they worship the same God. Well, I guess since they worship the same God, we're, it's saying they all go to heaven then. Because somebody worships God goes to heaven, right? Um, yeah, that may or may not be the truth. That's kind of up for debate, but you know, it's, you know, yeah, it, it caused yeah, there, a lot of confusion. Do you hear that Orthodox? It's up for debate in your communion, whether or not Muslims worship the same God. Y'all hear that? I'm just saying that the admissions that they make on the show kind of speaks for itself. It, pay attention, Orthodox. Do you hear that? Pay attention, Catholics who are discontent with Catholicism and are thinking about going to Orthodoxy. Pay attention to what they're saying. That's open for debate in Eastern Orthodoxy. Whether or not Muslims and Christians worship the same God, you just heard from Father. It's open for debate in Eastern Orthodoxy. Just pay attention to the, some of the things that he, he admits. And those of y'all who are discontent, thinking, I got to jump ship, I got to go, the grass is greener on the other side, I want you to hear all the admissions where Father is saying, no, the grass isn't necessarily greener on the other side, which is what I was saying in the video, right? Which brings me back to, well, then if the grass isn't greener on the other side, and it's not really green on our side, how do you determine which side to go to? Well, objective truth, Right. In the papacy, claims to the authority, things like that. The, that's where we're going to have to, you know, determine where the truth is. Hence why I said at the very outset, it all really hinges on the question of, is the papacy of a divine institution? If so, I have to be there. If not, don't waste your time. That's what I said, right? And, and, and Pope Francis is not really you know, like a, a dog dogmatically nuanced Pope, you know, right. I agree. I mean, <laughs> right. you know, right. Pope John Paul II and uh, I'm not sure he was either. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying people want to contrast of like, you know, John Paul II was the just most dogmatic. And I understand he had a really good foundation of philosophy. I'm just saying, I, yeah, I mean, he was, he's better at dogmatics than, than uh, Pope Francis, sure. But I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Let me stop there. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth were more kind of uh, rigorous theologians, right. and so yeah, yeah. you know, po Pope Francis, he's not going to necessarily take into account all the the theological mm -hmm. nuances. Yeah. You know, I agree with him. I agree. You know, and he so, said a few know, whoppers, <laughs> right? A few, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, I I think the the other maybe uh, the other thing that I would few, but your bishops love them. So I'm just saying, uh, I'm just saying, your bishops love them, and they love them for those whoppers too. Some of them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. but again, our bishops aren't indefectible. Our bishops aren't infallible. As if that's what we're claiming anyway. As if that's really what we're saying. The concern is, but you're in communion with people that you're saying are heretics effectively. The ad is that the, 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 the Pope, at least the present Pope, and I think even Benedict, um, not John Paul so much because I think he was sort of shunned by at least the Russian church. Um, you know, they've been really very gracious to the Orthodox church. Ain't that the truth? We've bent over backwards historically, I would say, to the Orthodox and that's why I've said before, we, we've done a lot to bend over backwards for unity with the Orthodox. We've gone way out of our way. Time after time, reached out.
and just time after time we we get rejected i think at this point it's up to the orthodox to make some gestures i i i don't think that it's up to rome to really continue to reach out and bend over backwards i think it's up to the uh, bishops in the Eastern Orthodox to do so. Mm -hmm. um, we received relics back from them. And then this particular Pope Francis has been very, very close to uh, Patriarch uh, Bartholomew. It goes both ways, though. But, yeah. Of Constantinople. And there's a lot of rhetoric going on about how, you know, we are separated sister churches, et cetera, et cetera, breathe with both lungs, you know, et cetera. Um, and so I think... Huh? The breathe of both lungs was in reference, I thought, to the Eastern Catholics. Was that wrong? You know, they've been, they, they I think they've treated us quite well. And, you know, the idea. And how have y'all treated us? I'm just asking. How, how have Orthodox treated Catholics, though? Look into it. Yeah, that Orthodox Christians are, you know, according to Roman Catholic practice, permitted to receive or uh, to receive communion in a Catholic church. Of course, we are not permitted. Let's make that very clear. <laughs> you say that, but then I can tell you Eastern Orthodox priests are con celebrating with Eastern Catholic priests, not not only sharing in communion, but actually confecting the Eucharist together, con celebrating at the same divine liturgy. So, I mean, you say that. And okay, you might be technically right, just according to you know whatever the decision your senate has made. Uh, but is that really happening? What's actually you know is that really what's going on? Feet on the ground. Now that doesn't take away, of course, from something objective as far as an objective standard. I, I get that. I understand that. I, I totally get that. I, but I'm just saying we need to put that out there. This isn't necessarily the case. <laughs> Uh, from our standpoint, but they would let us, and I think that's that kind of speaks to to where they're at. Sure, thanks. Mm, it does speak to where we're at. Mm -hmm. It basically says that what we're doing is we are extending the sacraments, the availability thereof to sacrament uh, of the sacraments to Orthodox who don't have the ability to get to their priest. We're extending that to them. Uh, even though we know that's in conflict with some other things, we recognize that it is helpful and um, maybe even good in some other areas. So taking different things into account, that's where we uh, have landed. By the way, somebody's saying, when did this happen? Uh, I think this show was today, wasn't it? Somebody sent it to me this morning, and I appreciate wh whoever sent it to me. I Thank you for... For sending it to me, I wouldn't have uh, known about it otherwise. So, thank you uh, for tipping me off to it, and glad that uh, I've been able to review it so far. Father Daniel, okay, let's let's go to the next. And by the way, thank you, Emmanuel, for the super chat there. Uh, point here. This is at minute thirty six forty five, and it deals with the the sort of divisions. There's been a lot of talk. Uh, amongst the Roman Catholic apologists, especially, especially that are saying, hey, look, look at the Orthodox. They're fighting with one another. Ro uh, uh, Russia and Constantinople are, are, you know, excommunicating each other, etc. And so what he says at 3645, some of the people in my Greek Orthodox Church were telling me that, quote, the patriarch, that is Bartholomew, is a heretic. They were siding with Russia, that is the Russian patriarch, but were still in, in communion with the patriarch of Constantinople. So how would you answer, somebody comes to you, Father Daniel, and says, you know what, if you're the true church, you all sure don't look like it. That wasn't what I was saying. Why was I misrepresented like that, Father? Why, why did you do that? That's not what I said. I never said because y'all have these fights and divisions, you don't look like the church. When did I say that, Father? You read what I said, and then you read into me. And you didn't take into account the other things that I said, which is another confirmation for why it's clear you didn't watch my video. And that's uncharitable, right? I'm, I'm not judging the intentions. I'm assuming the intentions were good. I don't think you deliberately tried to do that. But objectively speaking what you did was very uncharitable because you're putting words into my mouth and making me 
say things that I didn't say. And, and you're attributing very bad arguments to me, unfair arguments. That's not what I said. My concern was the idea that you can say your patriarch is a heretic but remain in communion with him because in the first millennium that's going to go against a whole lot of fathers who are going to say otherwise right that's the problem that's what i was getting at and i wasn't saying okay this then means that you're not the true church because you have these divisions it's not what i was saying because i recognize first millennium was filled with schisms I do, however, have a concern. How are you going to now fix these schisms that you have when you don't have an emperor and you don't have a pope? So what are you going to do to fix them? That's my concern. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, more importantly, that what I'm trying to get at there, and maybe it was my fault for not making it even more explicit, but I thought I did sufficiently to not be mis, um, misunderstood and um, misrepresented in this fashion. I think I at least made it clear enough that this is my concern is that would then go against the practice of being in communion with an outright heretic. Moreover, it goes against, um, well, let me push pause on that next part because it's, it's going to tie into something father is going to bring up here in a moment. And I'll, I want to first hear what he has to say, and then I'll interact with it because well, you're so divided. I mean, here, here's the thing. I would absolutely agree that the faithful should not be openly critiquing hierarchs or, you know, uh, you know, calling a patriarch a heretic. Do you hear Father say that? Well, Father, I'm glad you agree with us Catholics in our councils, which the council that you would reject, right? Our Eighth Ecumenical Council says what you just said. We have a canon saying that. I'm glad you agree with our Eighth Ecumenical Council, which is a council y'all reject, and disagree with your own councils. This say the exact opposite of what you just said, Father. And here's the problem. This is why you have the true Orthodox, because the canon's like this in Eastern Orthodoxy. This is from the First Second Council, um, the so-called First and Second Council, 861. We, of course, as Catholics, don't accept but you definitely will have, in fact, I'm pretty sure this canon is in the rudder. So Orthodox canon law. Canon 15 says this, the rules laid down with reference to presbyters and bishops and metropolitans are still more applicable to patriarchs so that in case any presbyter or bishop or metropolitan dares to secede and apostatize from the communion of his own patriarch and fails to mention the latter's name in accordance with the custom duly fixed and ordained in the divine mystagogy, but before a conciliar verdict has been pronounced and has been passed judgment against them, so before a conciliar decision, creates a schism the holy council has decreed that this person shall be held an alien to every priestly function if only he be convicted of having committed this transgression of the law so even before conciliar decree this is happening accordingly these rules have been sealed and ordained and respecting those persons listen respecting those persons who under the pretext of charges against their own presidents stand aloof and create a schism and disrupt the union of the church but as for those persons on the other hand who on account of some heresy condemned by the holy councils or fathers withdrawing themselves from communion from their president who that is to say is preaching the heresy publicly and teaching in barehead in church, uh, teaching it barehead in church. Such persons not only are not subject to any canonical penalty on account of their having been walled themselves off from any and all communion within the one called a bishop before any conciliar or synodal verdict has been rendered, but on the contrary, they are to be deemed worthy to enjoy the honor which befits them among Orthodox Christians, for they have defied not bishops, but pseudo bishops and pseudo teachers, and they have not been sundered from the union of the church with any schism but on the contrary have been said Julius, to rescue the church from schisms and divisions what does that mean what does that mean what that is saying is if you as a layman as an orthodox think that your patriarch is a heretic you think it's going against a council or father you believe it you're, you're thinking that they're a heretic you're fine to separate yourself from communion with your patriarch and you're not in schism. Guess what that's called? 
That's called true orthodoxy today. That's called the non-canonical orthodox. There's a whole bunch of them. And this is one of the arguments they would use. They'll use your own canons. They'd allow your laity to say these things about your patriarch. They'll back it up with stuff like that, Father. So you say that, yeah, you agree with me that they shouldn't be saying that. But guess what? You just took our position and our ecumenical council over against one of your own councils and one of your own canons in your own collection of canon law. And that's why you have the true orthodox because they believe that world orthodoxy, these guys are praying with heretics and there's canons against praying with heretics. Therefore, I'm entitled to separate myself from the bishop, from the patriarch, and I'm not in schism by having my trailer park liturgy. And, and I'm not in schism from doing all this and just kind of being isolated in my own world. I'm not in schism because my patriarch's a heretic and the canons allow for that, for me to make that decision. Now, you might say, well, okay, that's an abuse of the canon. Oh, okay. All right. Guess what? That's why we had a canon correcting this one. Did you know that? That's why we had a canon in our Eighth Ecumenical Council correcting this just a few years later. Because we saw that this whole issue was a problem, right? So we corrected it and said that no layman can separate from their own patriarch without there being a synodal decision actually excommunicating and declaring that patriarch a heretic. The same would apply then to the bishop, right? So we actually have safeguards canonically against that. I'd like to see your, your safeguards. Okay. So he agrees with me, but I don't think he realized the implications of what he just said in light of some of their own canons. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, it happens a lot you know, these days. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it happens a lot, but on the basis of your own canons. We live in, you know, kind of a, you know, a forgive me, you know, with the with the Internet and all that. And, you know, people feel empowered, you know, to to do yeah. these things. Mm -hmm. You know, they read some right. of the blogs. Um, I would say, actually, in my experience, um, uh, you know, and take it for what you will. I, I found much more reverence for hierarchy among the orthodox faithful in the parishes i've been at but father's going to admit here that he's not very familiar with the online orthodox but okay in his on his local level he's he's experienced a lot more fidelity to the local bishop okay but i mean again your your local experience doesn't determine truth right i mean you you might have some orthodox who are very pious and very reverent towards their bishops and that's great that's fine that's wonderful and, and my argument here isn't even going to criticize, like disprove, I should say, orthodoxy. Just because you have this canon that would allow you to separate from your patriot, that doesn't disprove orthodoxy. My point was it is against the practice, however, of the earlier church. And I think it's problematic because you now have people who are criticizing their patriot, calling them a heretic, and are remaining in communion with them. Tell me how that works with the canons and the first millennium and the father. Tell me, explain that one to me. That was what I'm getting at. Then in the Catholic church. Um, really? You know, when, well, when I was a Catholic, I mean, if you're, if you're faithful Catholic, you know, trying to live according to more traditional teachings, you know, you're usually, you know, looking at everything the Pope says and critiquing this and not this and this and mm. this and not that. But Father, I'm the very one who's always correcting those Catholics. I'm the very one doing that because I recognize the problem to it and I recognize that that does lead to Eastern Orthodoxy or set of Kantism or elsewhere. That's why I spend a lot of my time focusing on criticizing those Catholics. That's why I have a million videos on it. That's why I focus on the magisterium, right? So, yeah, you'll find Catholics who do that. I agree, Father. I totally agree. But that's why I, I critique them all the time, because I think that they are being inconsistent. Yes. Um, you know, your local bishops, you a lot of times really kind of uh, ignore a lot of things they say because they're there to perform confirmations at parishes. 
I, and I don't think that's the right approach. But on the flip side, do you agree with everything your bishop says? No. So you recognize, okay, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Okay, that's what we're saying. Now, I understand some, that, at least that's what I'm saying. I understand there's some traditionalists out there that aren't saying that. They criticize everything the Pope says. They criticize everything the bishops say. That's something I reject. I reject those guys. I reject that position. I think they, it leads elsewhere. It's a schismatic mentality. And I spend a lot of time criticizing them if you watch my videos. You know, and right. you right. know, you probably think your local bishop is a liberal, so you're going to listen to well, this bishop. Sounds like a lot of Orthodox and what they think about their bishop. <laughs> Again, Father, um, you, maybe you just don't, you're not familiar with a very large amount of orthodox who would say the same thing about their bishops at least in the united states i don't know like you know what it is like abroad i'm just saying as far as the united states this bishop in denver or this cardinal here you know you're not right. going to listen right. to these bishops so you know that's just that's kind of part of catholic life is like critiquing wow. bishops and pointing out the yeah, Father, I agree. They're they're wrong, and they have a schismatic mentality, and if they keep it up, they're going to leave Catholicism. The things they say that you disagree with, um, you know, it, it's kind of a kind of an interesting thing. I, I think, like, you know, uh, Protestantism, you have that idea of private judgment, but if I reflect back on my Catholic years, like, that's kind of what I did a lot. It, and I understand, Father, you did that a lot. And that's very sad to hear because it sounds like you had a very bad understanding of your, your obedience to the magisterium and how that works. That being said, there are some cases where the magisterium itself allows us to withhold assent in very limited cases. We've spoken about it a million times. Donum Veritatis. Go and look, watch shows where I discuss it at length, right? There's rare cases where you're, you're allowed to withhold assent. Sure, sure. But for the most part, you your automatic disposition towards teachings, right, on matters of faith and morals, has to be one of ascent. It, at least the autumn, the the disposition, right? I told, I said there's an exception, exceptions. The disposition should not be one of I'm going to push back and disagree. The disposition should be I'm going to ascend. So if you if you did that, Father, I'm sorry to hear that, but you, you're you were part of the same people that I'm criticizing who are Catholics. You're part of that. You were part of that same group. And of course you left Catholicism. Of course you did, because I've been saying these people, they, they have a schismatic mentality and disposition and they will leave Catholicism. And you're, you're proof to that. Now that's not to say that that was the only reason why you left. Clearly it wasn't, but it does sound like it factored in, I would imagine. So, all right. Is like, I, well, you know, I had an idea of what the true, faith was and true doctrine and you know i judged whether what came from the hierarchs constantly was the true faith and what wasn't and what i had to listen to and what i didn't have to listen to uh, again father if that were the case you had a very schismatic mentality when you were catholic and i'm sorry to see that and i'm not surprised that you left catholicism with that mentality i've been correcting people who have that mentality because yeah if you continue to maintain that idea sooner or later you're going to realize its implications Again, that being said, that doesn't mean that there aren't some cases where you could reserve a synth. Again, the magisterium allows for very limited circumstances, sure. But as a general rule, there needs to be a synth and there needs to be obedience, right? Just depending on what it is that's being promulgated. All right. Um, I just haven't wow. found that yeah. same climate in the in the Orthodox Church. Now, and certainly when there's a crisis. You're well, I mean, in fairness, in the Orthodox Church, there's not a whole lot of um, authoritative teaching going on. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, Father. There's not as much authoritative teaching going on in uh, Orthodoxy because y'all don't really have an objective magisterium. So there's going to be a little less room for that there. But yeah, sure. Maybe there's a better climate in Eastern Orthodoxy, at least in, in some of our experiences when it comes to this area. That's fine. That, that's not going to prove uh, Catholicism. It's not going to disprove Catholicism. It's not going to prove Orthodoxy. It's not going to disprove Eastern Orthodoxy. It, it's going to just be 
a, a phenomenon that we have to say, hmm, that's interesting and here's some tendencies, but that's not going to determine the truth for us. We're going to have that. You had it with the COVID stuff, with the masks, right? Yeah, for you sure. Know, you, ha- for sure. you have it with Constantinople and Moscow is, you know, you get the blogosphere going and, you know, but uh, on the whole, I found, uh, you know, a, a, a very healthy and... Um, in, in about one minute, we're going to get into my territory, the Magisterium. And that's why I'm still going. Some of y'all are like, you're still going, Michael? As if y'all are surprised. <laughs> As if y'all are surprised at two hour and 15 minute video. As if that's unusual. <laughs> y'all know we do these epic long, you know, Lord of the Rings length videos. Y'all, y'all already know. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to wrap it up, but I, I did have a few other things to say, and I want to try to knock it out in one video, not multiple. So, um, I'll, we're going to go as long as it takes, uh, Lord willing. Uh, but I, I will try to be succinct, but here he's going to dive into the magisterium and y'all, y'all know, Ooh, this is, this is, that's where my ears perk up. Mm, we're talking about the magisterium. Okay. Let, let's, let's get ready. All right. So here we go. You know, I've been, uh, you know, really just, um, you know, pleasantly surprised by that, the, the, the reverence toward bishops among the Orthodox faithful. All right. Hello. I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't have my on button on. I was just going to say that, um, you know, you have a whole YouTube, Catholic YouTube channel called Church Militant that does mm-hmm. nothing but expose scandals and criticize bishops. And look, there, there's, as he's going to know, I mean, no, there, there's some need for that. There's some good, but I don't think it's the best idea to do nothing but focus on those things. I do think that that's going to be unhealthy for people. It's going to scandalize them. It's not a healthy diet. If all you're doing is just criticizing bishops and that's all you focus on, I'm, you might be doing some good, but I, I don't know if that's going to be very helpful long term for most people who have a diet of just that. So I would agree if your diet is just this bishop did this wrong, this bishop is doing this scandal, you're going to get scandalized pretty quickly. I'm not saying just close your eyes and ears and pretend that everything's okay. That's not what I'm saying either. I'm just saying you you don't have to constantly expose yourself to literally everything that is taking place as far as scandals in the church, there's no need for you to be informed about every single scandal. There, there's perfectly, there's no reasonable reason why you, you should say, I have to know about every single scandal, <laughs> right? But what are you going to do about it? I mean, <laughs> most of these things are going to be not very helpful for you. You do need, ha- need to have a general awareness of, of what's going on. Sure. But it's like, I mean, do I need to know what's going on in the world and, and some of the things that are happening? Yeah, but it do is that all I need to do is just focus on literally how many murders happened today, how many rapes happened today, and let me go and read all about all these murders and all these rapes every single day, and this is all I ever do is just sit here and read about murders and rapes. I mean, after a while, that's going to have an impact on you emotionally. Especially if you're not doing some other things like praying, fasting, and reading scripture. And, you know, so you're going to need something to balance that diet out, right? So I, I kind of agree a little bit with, with what Father is saying here. And I'm not saying that scandal shouldn't be exposed, but it's just a constant barrage of, you know, really scrutinizing every single thing that's said. And it's, it's uh it's tough it's very yeah, very difficult I, no i mean and you have catholics you know uh speak triumphantly of the magisterium and that we have that in the catholic church well the magic no i mean do we really speak triumphantly of the magisterium? i have it please introduce me to these people who speak triumphantly of the magisterium I don't hear a whole lot of Catholics talking about the magisterium. That's part of the problem. I don't know who these people are. The magisterium, the teaching authority of the church is the bishops. But you know, Well, Father, we agree that the authority in the church is the bishops. We, we all agree with that, right? There, there's no doubt about that. Of course, the teaching authority is the bishops, and we recognize that in that sense you have a magisterium. 
right? The local bishop teaching. I've said this many times when I speak about Catholicism. I'm sorry, orthodoxy. I'll, I'll note that, yeah, in a very loose sense, they have a magisterium, the bishop, of course, teaching on the local level. Yeah, I've heard me say that millions of times. Or even an ecumenical council. But what do I say right after that? But then identifying what an ecumenical council is, is the problem. That's what I always say after that. Y'all probably heard me say it a million times. So <clears throat> I recognize, loosely speaking, you have a magisterium in one sense. And then in another sense, you don't have a magisterium. That's why I always say you don't have an objective way to identify your magisterium on the universal level. That's why I always say that. And I think I even said that in the video with Frat. I understand on the local level, you have an objective way to identify the teaching authority. The, the bishop preaching, teaching, his sermons, his letters, stuff like that, right? I'm not disputing that. I'm talking about what happens when your bishop says this and another bishop says that or the no bishop says that your bishop doesn't say anything. How do you then know what the correct understanding then of what is in the deposit of faith is? And it might be something that's hard to discern. How, how do you know then? Okay, that's when we talk magisterium above the local level, above the bishop. We now start talking about councils. We now start talking about the Vincentian canon, right? We, we now start talking about the office of the papacy for Catholics as well. We now start talking about things above the local magisterium. And if all you're giving me is just local magisterium, I mean, you're going to run into some, uh, some serious problems, right? Um, what, what happens if Nestorius is my patriarch, <laughs> he's my bishop and he's teaching heresy. What, it, I mean, you, you can't just say, well, just look to your local bishop. My local bishop is Nestorius. <laughs> you're going to have to say, well, look to scripture, look to this. You're going to now start to take me outside of the local magisterium. Right. Okay. You know, they're, they're spending their time critiquing bishops all the time you know, openly, um, you know, uh, that sounds like some orthodox to me. I, I'm just saying, father, let's be consistent. Oh, you know, and I, I'm, of course, I'm fine with people disagreeing, you know, with things privately, but putting that out there publicly, I mean, is that, is that really Christian? It just seems like another form of Protestantism to me. I, I agree. It's very problematic. It's definitely there in orthodoxy. Honestly. Mm, well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because at, one hour, right at the one hour mark, here's what Michael often says. He says, as I was Orthodox, my questions weren't being answered satisfactorily. He talks about that again and again. And I think you touched on that, you know, the idea of the intellectual um, exercise of Catholicism. So he says, as I was Orthodox, my questions weren't being answered satisfactorily. The Catholic Church was answering my questions, especially when it came to the papacy, teaching authority. What's an ecumenical council? Is an ecumenical council infallible? And he, and he says parenthetically, that's up to de for debate among some Orthodox. So how do I even identify this teaching authority in Orthodoxy? And that's basically the claim that he lays. He says, you know, Orthodox, ask five Orthodox and you'll get six different answers. Uh, whereas in Catholicism, you have a magisterium and you have, uh, you know, I've been told that before. I said, they said, you know, it's very comforting because I can pick up the official catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. I can turn to page 62 and there. That's not a good argument. <laughs> I mean, I, I believe there's some utility to the catechism. I've said that before, right? Just for the average person, there's some utility there, sure. But don't just think just because it's in the catechism, therefore, that settles it. No, because as we've noted before, not everything that is in the catechism is taught with the same level of authority. Okay. So some things are taught with an extremely low level of teaching authority and have a very low level of assent and may be reformable. And then some things in the catechism are irreformable and they demand divine and Catholic faith. I mean, there's no reversing it. <clears throat> there's a whole lot in between then. 
Okay. So for the average person to open up their catechism, that, that's fine. That, that works for most people's intents and purposes. But it doesn't work as, hey, if it's in the catechism, that immediately settles it. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Now you're going too far in, your, in what you're using the catechism for. Now you're misunderstanding and you're setting yourself up for failure because we've had revisions in the catechism. Right. Does that then mean that the church is constantly changing its faith? No, it's that you're under not understanding the magisterium. Well, that's what it means. First, the answer. So what <laughs> yeah. say you? It's more an illusion of clarity. So. So our claims to the Catholic magisterium is an illusion of clarity that and I'm going to show you why he's, he's wrong. But that's exactly what somebody would say who doesn't understand the magisterium very well. I know why he says this. At one point, I thought the same. Um, but as you're going to see here, he's not very up on the magisterium and how it works. And that's partly our fault. And that's partly why I focus on the magisterium, so that we can help offset this misunderstanding. Here we go. In terms of my questions weren't being answered satisfactorily, I mean, that's not surprising to hear. I mean, what percentage of our priests are, you know, going to be well versed in Roman Catholicism and be able to, the final, you know. Father, when did I say that? Give me the timestamp when I said that I went to my local priest and he wasn't able to answer my questions. Therefore, orthodoxy doesn't have the answers. When did I say that, Father? I did mention going and mentioning my concerns to my priest because that's where you should start, right? You mention, you present yourself to the priest and you present your concerns to them. But that's not all I said. I've looked elsewhere. I've looked away above priests. I recognize the average priest doesn't know a whole lot about these things. So I recognize that just because the average priest doesn't have an answer here doesn't mean orthodoxy is wrong any more than Catholicism is wrong because the average priest in Catholicism doesn't have answers. I know that. <laughs> That's not what I said. That's misunderstanding me because I think that you didn't really give me a fair shake at this. I don't think you really listened to my material. And you're critiquing something else. You're, you're critiquing somebody else. You're not critiquing Michael Lofton on Matt Fred show. You're critiquing some, something else out there. Points compare of, uh, yeah, yeah. All, all of these points you know i mean if i were go to a catholic priest and ask them to speak about orthodoxy i mean if i were mm. to you know tell a catholic priest like hey i'm you know reading about <laughs> theosis and the fathers and father did did you really think that that that's what i was do you think that that i'm really that inconsistent and and really that short-sighted and i haven't really thought maybe maybe you don't know maybe you just think I'm just a regular guy who hasn't really thought through these things, don't really know what, but okay. But if you watched my video, you would have known I'm not that. So I have to wonder, who are you confusing me with? You're confusing me with randoms on Facebook and randoms on Twitter. You're confusing me with people who haven't thought through this very well and haven't asked, am I being consistent? I ask, am I being consistent? That That's... A problem here. I know that you go to the average priest, they're not going to know what theosis is or essence and energies. I mean, I, I get that. I, I totally understand that. And same applies for Eastern Orthodox priests when it comes to essence and energies, by the way. Just throwing that one out there. But uh, yeah, I, I totally get it. You go to the average priest, they don't, they don't know. And then that's okay. I mean, I, I get it. Most of their interaction is going to be with people who haven't really studied that stuff. And so they're dealing with very practical questions. And so it, it's really not necessary for them to have to be prepared to answer those level that those kinds of questions. The average person isn't asking those questions. So I, I get it. That's fine. It's not a knock on the priests. But don't think that all I did was just go to a couple of priests and just think, well, the priest can't answer my question, so I guess I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm not an idiot. I, I know this. So why the misrepresentation? To me, I, I know it's not coming from a place, bad motives, you know, on y'all's part, but I just have to wonder, 
where is it then coming from? Because it's not coming from anything I said in the interview. I know that much for sure. Right? All this, they would, Essence, you know, energies, distinction. Of them would not know what you're <laughs> right. talking about, at least. And the right, other 25% right. wouldn't really be able to say much. So, right. Um, good, good. So, I mean, it, it's not that surprise, a big of a surprise that the questions weren't being an answered satisfactorily if you, like, you know, uh, go to a parish. But that's not what I did, Father. So why, why did you have all these people that are listening thinking that, wow, this, this, this guy's an idiot. I mean, he, he's this Catholic. He goes from Catholicism to Orthodoxy, Catholicism, just because a priest can't answer his question. Gosh, these people are just ridiculous. This is what you're giving the impression. And, and I have to ask, is that being charitable? Um, objectively, I'm sure it, it, the intentions are there to be charitable, but objectively speaking, no, that's not charity because part of being charitable is representing the, your interlocutor and representing an opponent accurately. That That's also part, not just good intentions, but also fair representation. Um, it, yeah, in the Catholic Church, I mean, there was a Catholic theologian, um, Eric, uh, and his last name is Polish, I, so I... I'll probably butcher the pronunciation, but Prisvara, um, who described the the last 500 years in the West as this fearful search for certitude, you know, kind of a Cartesian wow. desire for clear and. Father, stop mistaking me with the, the, this nonsense. I, I hear this all the time, and this is what was discouraging for me, by the way, Father. Is because I'm coming with legitimate questions about canons that I'm seeing in the early church. Legitimate questions from multiple saints and fathers and, and popes in the first millennium. I'm coming with questions and I'm being met with this level of engagement by people who aren't just average priests. By people who are, should know better. <clears throat> I'm not looking for this Cartesian certainty. You know? Stop, stop. Just stop that. I'm tired of hearing this nonsense. Please stop the bad arguments. Stop the misrepresentation. Take a moment and try to hear what some of us are saying. Stop caricaturizing us. Stop doing it. Stink. And so I, right, I think right. you have to remember that, take into consideration that that epistemology and the expectations of that um, in the philosophical currents kind of underlie. No, Father, that that's it's not that's not it. You, you've you've not you, you definitely have me confused with the um, rhetoric you you generally hear in this area, right? You 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 have me confused with just somebody who hasn't really thought through these things effectively and and that's just not the case how the the desire catholics have for things and so like you know in the in you know uh the early 20th century uh, maybe before i forget what it came out among catholics for, for catechesis of young people they had something called the baltimore catechism which was this very rote question and answer format of things question one who is god God is the supreme being. Ding. You know, you get the answer, right? You know, why <laughs> right. did God make man? God. Father, that's not what I'm looking for here. Please stop. Just stop because you're, you're misrepresenting us and it's uncharitable. Again, I'm not judging your intentions. Your intentions are to be charitable. I'm not judging any of the internal. I'm, I'm, I'm judging objectively what you're doing here. It's uncharitable. It's not. It's not engaging us fairly. And it's then going to mislead the people that are listening to your podcast or you know whatever made man to know him to love him to serve him this life and to be happy with him forever in the next wow ding You're you know up. you get that the so, answer the d definitive the, answer the right that, that's what i'm looking for i just need a definitive ding answer to everything literally everything nope nope but 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 for you to still be wrestling with basics of the Christian faith that have massive implications practically, such as rebaptism, such as the role of the primates on the universal level, 
that's going to have massive implications for you to still be wrestling with this 2,000 years later, especially in light of the fact this has already been settled. That's what I'm talking about. That's what's the problem. This is the issue. When you have then many saints affirming our position and rejecting yours, testifying to our ecclesiology and not yours, that's my concern. That's the issue. You tell me, look to the saints, look to the fathers. You tell me these things, but then I look to them and they're not backing you up in many cases. So I'm trying to ask, okay, well, you told me to look to them and it sure seems to be pointing to Rome. What do I do here? Oh, well, you just want these ding answers and just a definitive answer to a Baltimore catechism. That's not what I'm doing, Father. I'm just holding you to your own position. You tell me, go to the first millennium, look to the fathers, look to that which has been consistently preached and taught, look to the councils, look to the this, look to the that, look to the saints, look to the liturgy. You tell me these places to look, and then I'm doing it, and I'm saying, mm, yeah, I know it's not a, always clear cut, but, I mean, it sure doesn't look in favor in some points here of orthodoxy. So what do we do? <laughs> One is the case of the papacy. Another is the case of rebaptism, and then I can mention many others. That's what I'm trying to get answers to, Father. The right. answer. So mm -hmm. in terms of, like, things like the papacy and infallibility, you know, a lot of Catholics will think of this as like, well, the buck needs to stop somewhere. And like with all the confusion, the, there needs to be somewhere where you can go and say, well, here is the clear answer, except you don't actually necessarily get that from it. That's not actually, that's what your average Joe is saying. That's not what I'm saying, father. You, you're, you were prepared to engage the, the regular... That's not what I'm saying about the magisterium. First of all, I recognize if I'm just giving something authoritative yet non-definitive, that's sufficient. That's sufficient. It doesn't even have to be definitive. It doesn't have to be definitive. As long as it's authoritative but non-definitive, that will suffice in many of these cases. That will suffice. That's all I need. <clears throat> In some cases, however, when things are just massively in dispute, at some point you do need a definitive decision. And, and you ought to agree with that, Father. I mean, do you think we should have just let the Aryan crisis go on forever? I mean, th don't you think there was a reason why an ecumenical council really needed to put it to an end? I mean, you would agree, okay, at some point, sure, we do need to have a, a definitive decision, right? I'm not saying we have to have a definitive decision on everything. I'm just saying in some cases where it's very important and things are in dispute, at least give me a non-definitive authoritative decision, right? At least give me that. Uh, otherwise, you just leave us all to our own devices and we're just trying to figure things out by ourselves. And that might work in some cases and that might also work for some period of time. That's not going to work indefinitely, you know, especially if there becomes massive disputes and the thing in dispute has massive implications. Okay, so that's that's not going to work. But here, Father is going to go and completely misrepresent me and confuse me with somebody who knows nothing about the magisterium. And I'm sure he's just hearkening back to his own understanding of the magisterium when he was Catholic. And his own understanding of the magisterium, it sounds like, was very deficient. Um, and, and doesn't really take into account the vast majority of what I'm saying or people who have studied the magisterium are saying. Let's listen. Fallibility. Um, so the Pope says something infallibly. The you know the how did we get to the pope teaching infallibly father why are we talking about the pope all of a sudden you know why because you automatically think that what we're saying is to have something definitive which i'm not even saying we have to have something definitive you got me confused but to have something definitive you have to have a next cathedral teaching that's what the average person thinks right that's not me that's not me i know better than that you can have a solemn definition at an ecumenical council. You can have the ordinary and universal magisterium proposing something to be held definitively constantly, right? So there are other ways to engage the church's irreformability in its teachings than just an ex cathedra. That's the, that's the pop, pop apologetics. Stop confusing me with that. <clears throat>
So that that's how we all of a sudden ended up in ex cathedra. Why are we talking about ex cathedra? But okay. The definition of papal infallibility and primacy at Vatican one, you know, the first Vatican Council in 1869 to 70. So, you know, the Pope is infallible when speaking on faith and morals, you know, ex cathedra, you know, not from the consensus of the church. Well, then you have a period of reception, though, where theologians the uh, pick out all oh that yeah wording, and what does that actually mean uh, there there we go y'all hear this <laughs> father we we recognize there there is a role to deception. or i'm sorry <laughs> i said deception to reception there is a role to reception in some cases in some cases in some cases never in the case to something that is taught irreformably however no 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 not in those cases um so it's not going to determine something being taught irreformably. It's not going to make it irreformable reception. Um, in some very rare cases where it might be hard to discern, has it been taught irreformably? Reception might help, sure. Reception helps when it comes to the weight of non-definitive yet authoritative teachings. It's going to have an impact there. Uh, it's going to increase the weight the more it's been received, right? Uh, but something taught in some random papal encyclical that nobody ever thinks of after the Pope says it and it's been just abandoned to the trash is going to have a much lower level, right, than some something that has been widely received. Not the same thing as something has been taught definitively by the Pope. Does it need to be received? That, no. Not for it to be irreformably taught, but I will say that if it has been ir irreformably taught, it will be received, if not immediately, generally immediately, but if not immediately, within a fair amount of time, it will be received. It will, because the Holy Spirit's not going to just allow some prolonged state where he, he gives the people who are infused with his graces um, this idea that they're just completely contrary to something that has that he has definitively taught through his teaching authority. I mean, that's just going to be inconsistent. The Holy Spirit's not going to allow that. In and when is For something sure. infallible? And there you go. When is something infallible? Father doesn't know. No, okay, I get it. Your average Catholic priest doesn't really know much about the magisterium. I, I totally get it. That's why I'm doing what I do, Father. That's why I do all of these videos. That's why I talk about the magisterium. And now he's going to start to engage the very thing I'm writing my dissertation on. Because I think it's really important. Because I do think that we need to clarify some of these things. Some of these principles that identify definitive teachings. Not that they aren't there. They are there. But we need to, you know, sometimes maybe condense. But put it put it together and, and, and make it very, very clear. Um, show, show that there is a consistency here. And then disseminate it. Because it's generally known among scholars. It's not very well known among the popular level. And I think it needs to be known on the popular level. So there are answers to your questions of how do you determine whether something is infallibly taught by a pope or not. There are indicators there. That's what I'm writing my, writing my dissertation on. The indicators, indicators, and also evaluating magisterial propositions and the levels of assent owed to them from the Second Vatican Council unto the present, focusing especially on the works of uh, Francis Sullivan, Comparing and contrasting it with others in the post conciliar era as well. That's what I'm that's what I'm focusing on. So there are definite objective answers to what you're saying, Father. Just because you you it's unclear in your mind doesn't mean that there aren't answers here. There are. And then, you know, so the Pope says something and then everyone debates. Was he infallible when he was saying <laughs> everyone is just so unclear, right? <laughs> Munificentissimus Deus, right? It's just so unclear. We just don't know. Is this thing definitive or not? I don't know. <laughs> Is the Immaculate Conception taught definitively? I, so unclear. I don't know. There's just a massive debate afterwards, right? <laughs> when Pius the Ninth re releases it. It's just massively debated. Every Nobody knew. <laughs> There's clear indicators there, right? <laughs> so that's not true. There's a grain of truth to what you're saying, though, Father, a grain of truth, right? There's some rare exceptions where a pope might say something, and it's uh, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis is a perfect example. Did, did he teach something definitively by the um, papal magisterium there, right? Was, was that ex cathedra? Okay. 
there's questions like that. Sure, 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 sure. Not as clear cut. What do we do with those? There are answers. They, they do take a little bit more of an explanation that you just, you know, generally tend to find on Facebook or something. They do take a little bit more explanation. But those are more the rare circumstances. The majority of cases, it, it, it's not this just massive debate and there are no clear indicators. That, that's misrepresenting us. And why are we limiting things to the papal magisterium anyway? Why, why are you automatically, why do you automatically go when we talk about something definitive? And I wasn't even asking for definitive teachings. Why do you automatically go to the Vatican I papacy? You want to know why? Because you're not very much familiar with what we teach. What we also said at Vatican I, interestingly enough, is those things that are taught by the ordinary and universal magisterium are also definitive. That's where you really start seeing the ordinary and universal magisterium being explicitly engaged by the magisterium itself. What about ecumenical councils? They don't teach solemnly. We haven't had any ecumenical councils teach anything solemnly since the second, the seventh ecumenical council. I mean, why does your mind automatically go to the papacy? But yeah, sure. There are some cases that might be in dispute. Has the teaching here, it does, is the teaching here, has it been taught definitively? But the problem here, father is let's say there's a debate on whether or not something has been taught definitively by Pope. So what? It's been authoritatively taught yet. At the very least, it's been authoritatively taught. Even if we're uncertain, is it definitive? At the very least, it's authoritative, non-definitive. Therefore, I may not dissent from it ordinarily. And my obligation is to give religious submission of intellect and will. That is why I say, I'm just happy if you give me a non-definitive authoritative teaching. I don't even need something definitive. I just need to know, is it authoritative or not? And that's pretty easy to establish, right? Very easy to establish. So <clears throat> this is just completely mishandling our understanding of the magisterium. It just shows that you don't know much about it. And that's okay. I don't expect, you know, most, most priests today to know much about the magisterium. That's fine. That's not a knock on priests. I get it. But don't think just because you don't have answers, therefore, there really are no answers. And it's so unclear here as you're presenting. This, was he not? You know, right. and there's no. Well, they're doing it today with Francis. Yeah. And there's there's no absolute definitive answer that you can point to. And there you go. No absolute definitive answer. There you go. Father, you're wrong. There's a complete misrepresentation of us. 100% wrong. When F is in Tismus Deus just doesn't exist. <laughs> just never happened. Right? Past returnus never happened. Um, the exclusivity of uh, ordination for men never been taught definitive. definitive. Well, I can maybe use that term. Yeah, ir irreformably, constantly never been proposed by the ordinary and universal magisterium. It's never been proposed as to be held definitively. We'll use it, the correct terminology there. That's never happened, right? Never happened. Ordinary and universal magisterium has never done that. It's never consistently taught that. It just doesn't exist. And there's no indication or there's no indicators where I can know when the ordinary and universal magisterium is actually consistently taught it. Just unknowable. Unknowable. Which undermines your own position, by the way. <laughs> because it basically means that you don't believe that anything has been taught according to the rule of St. Vincent. So it, it kind of undermines your, your own position and leaves you very unprepared to say, okay, uh, well, how could you have known prior to Nicaea 1 that Arianism was wrong? It leaves you vulnerable to that question <sighs> okay fine to that and i mean if you know if the pope says something infallibly who are the ones that are going to listen to him it's those who are faithful catholics it's not an authority mm. for those wishy-washy catholics or people who are outside what does this have to do with objective indicators to determine when something has been taught authoritatively or definitively 
What does this have to do with my concerns? The Catholic Church. So underlying it is this faith you've placed in this particular bit. Yeah, absolutely. Father, underlying my ascent to the magisterium is the faith that I already have in the magisterium and the teaching authority. Absolutely. Father, you have the same problem. Underlying your belief in Scripture, underlying your belief in the authority of Jesus is this faith that you already have, that Jesus is who he claims to be. Oh, of course. Of course. But as I've noted for our Protestants, the same arguments that I would use to defend the magisterium are the same fallible arguments that we would use to defend the canon and, and really to combat the Gnostics. I've, I've gone hour over that for hours and hours. So this isn't a problem for me. It's a problem for you, though. You know, um, right, right. You know, which we do in the Orthodox Church, too. We say, you know, Christ speaks to us through the bishops. You know, sometimes they're, you know. Except when the bishops are wrong, right? You know, right. Sometimes they say things that are a little off, you know. And what do you do then, Father? What do you do then? Does teaching authority stop there? No, you wouldn't say that, would you? Okay. So my bishop tells me this, and it sounds really wrong. It sounds really heretical. What do I do now, Father? You you got to give me a magisterium above now the local bishop. Oh, and, sure, you know, right? Um, but you know, um, uh, yeah. So and and I, mean, I I think that's. I think that's why the uh, definition of an ecumenical council that, for instance, um, Metropolitan Hilarion Alfeyev gives is right on the money. You know, in other words, there has to be that reception, which mm -hmm. takes time. Here we go. So reception theory being advocated for ec ecumenical councils, which I addressed in the video, by the way. Yeah, it's fraught with problems, filled with problems, reception theory. Not that there isn't a place in room for reception in Catholicism. There, there is a role of reception in Catholicism, but it's not the same thing as Kamiakov's reception theory. And I think this is where your weakness is greatest, Father. You know, th this is ultimately where I think orthodoxy is weakest, is this notion of reception theory for determining what is an ecumenical council, i.e. what is authoritative, uh, doctrinally speaking, above maybe the local synod, right? Um, <clears throat> this is a major problem, major issue filled with concerns. And I've expressed them many times before on the show, and I'm sure we'll do plenty more. Uh, but if this is the best that you can give me reception theory, you're not telling me anything I haven't already heard. And you understand that to be an ecumenical council. And it's not about the Pope of Rome signing on the dotted line and boom, all of a sudden it's ecumenical. And that's yeah. essentially what Lofton. That's not what Lofton is saying. Is and Eric Ibarra and so forth. Eric, did you? I saw you in the chat. Eric, you still there? Let me know. <laughs> Eric, you just got called out. They just told you that's effectively what they're saying. And boom, all of a sudden it's ecumenical. And that's yeah. essentially Boom. what Lofton is and Eric Ibarra and so forth are saying. Yeah, essentially, that's what we're saying. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> People ratification theory. That's what it boils down to, essentially. Boom, he signs onto the dotted line, therefore ecumenical. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, 649 would be ecumenical by that standard, right? There's all kinds of things that would be ecumenical by just the Pope signs on the dotted line, therefore it's ecumenical. That's not what papal ratification theory. That That might be you know, the average guy you talk to on Twitter's understanding of papal ratification, but that's, that's not what me, and I don't want to speak for Eric, but I know I can speak for Eric on this one. That's not what he's saying. <laughs> and I only know because we've talked about it a lot, right? So what are you doing? That's not representing us accurately at all. But, you know, I, I get the fathers don't really have a whole lot of reference to really engage what we're saying here. They're confusing what we're saying with the stuff that they encounter really low level apologetics, right? They're, they're, they're confusing us with that. And um, yeah, we, we've, we've thought through this a little bit more than that. So I, I think you need to engage what we're actually saying. Is that, you know, we don't have a clear, um, 
you know, singular understanding of what an ecumenical council is. And I think, you know, like you said, the answer is, yeah, that's right. Did you hear that? <laughs> He's saying, look, Michael's saying we don't have a singular theory of what an ecumenical council is. And I'm saying, yeah, that's right. I'm, thank you for admitting it. Uh, <laughs> not that I really needed you to, but I, I appreciate you. Uh, Catholics, y'all who are disgruntled <laughs> with Catholicism and you're looking at orthodoxy. Did you hear? Did you hear? They, they don't have a single unified theory to determine what is an ecumenical council. Now, I'm not saying the Catholic theory is just so easy that it's just bam. No, I mean, there, there does need to be a little bit of work that needs to be done and some qualifications. Absolutely, sure. And I'm not saying that we've always had a consistent theory that's always been explicitly clear. clear. But after 2,000 years, you should know. <laughs> And, and when you don't have any other teaching authority, you should definitely know now what an ecumenical council is. I mean, at least we could say, OK, well, if we're uncertain about an ecumenical council, we still at least have our, you know, teachings that are ex cathedra. And we at least still have the ordinary and universal magisterium. Like we, we at least have something. Y'all don't have really anything above an ecumenical council. So you should at least know what an ecumenical council is. Um. <laughs> What, what is this super chat? I appreciate it. Uh, Smoke Pork Riz. Let's see. Thanks for the epic stream, Mike. Did you watch at Dr. Uh, Marshall's newest stream? He's starting to go full Protestant. I have not seen it. I'll, I'll need to see it. The, I've, I've heard about the one on the Our Father. I'll have to check it out uh, soon. Uh, so I, I apologize. I can't really comment a whole lot on it. I'll definitely check it out, though. But, yeah, um, I, I'm not saying that, you know, we, we've always had just a perfect theory known from day one. No, 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 no. Nobody has ever had this, right? But by now, you should have a theory, especially when all you have above the Senate is an ecumenical council. You, you should know what constitutes an ecumenical council. You want to talk to us about ecumenical councils, but you can't really tell me what identifies an ecumenical council. You want to tell me to affirm the seven councils, but why seven? You, you can't really give me a consistent answer there. And I'm going to say that might be a sign of something for you. Maybe. Uh, are you familiar with St. Melito? I think he's underrated church father. Yeah, definitely familiar with him. How can we know the church fathers knew the, how can we know the church fathers knew the apostles, especially since St. Irenaeus, uh, who knew Polycarp got Jesus age wrong. Yeah. And that was an interesting thing. And whenever we interviewed airmen, you know, we brought that up with them and he tried to, you know, poke holes and everything like that in there. <clears throat> well, at the very least, I don't even ha actually have to make that claim. Technically, I, I don't even have to make the claim that these fathers actually knew the apostles. So let, let's go ahead and pretend for a moment that Irenaeus didn't. OK, let's, let's just pretend for a moment he didn't. The problem still is this. Irenaeus, however is part of a church that goes back in succession that can be traced back to the apostles that however is important that is still going to get us where we ultimately need to go even if they personally didn't know the guy the fact that they're claiming this objective lineage of authority going back to jesus and it's it's being testified to externally as well Nobody's questioning the authority. Nobody's saying, no, you don't have this succession. There's no reason to believe that they're lying here, blah, blah, blah. There's many, many reasons to bolster this claim of uh, an actual tactile apostolic succession. Not that succession is merely tactile. Um, that, that gets us where we need to go. So that, I think that's important. Um, appreciate it. Uh, Grant Michael says, I love the show. St. Benedict, pray for us. Indeed. Um, back to where we were, we were talking about ecumenical councils and how to identify them. I just thought it was really interesting that he openly admitted, yeah, we don't have a consistent way to identify this. Okay. That was my concern. That was my objection. And you, you conceded it. Okay. Thank you. You know? Well, but and, you know, I, I would think they would understand that in the Catholic Church because that's kind of what their podcast is devoted to, right? Is Did you hear that? That's what we're devoted to. Just like, you know, well, the Catholic Church says it's infallible, so we've got to go find the support for that. And that's what the podcast is devoted. <laughs> Come on. Why are you doing this to us? Stop. Just stop. No. 
And anytime we have had shows that testify to papal claims, it's not, oh, well, the claim is made, so we got we got to find some evidence for it. <laughs> That's not why we're doing it. That's not why the show exists. That's not why the podcast exists. That's not what's going on. That That's not it. <laughs> we're doing it because people are saying, okay, is there any evidence to this in the first millennium? So we're responding and say, yes, here it is. That's why we do those shows. But is that all we do? No, no. The majority of shows aren't defending papal primacy or establishing papal primacy in the first millennium. And first of all, why are we even talking about it? I thought we were talking about how to identify an ecumenical council. And you said we have the same problem, and then you immediately shift to the papacy. I thought we were talking about that. And we have objective ways to identify these things in the first millennium when it comes to the papal claims. And we have objective ways to identify what's an ecumenical council that is consistent. So what, what's, I, I don't see it. I, I just, I don't feel they really engaged us very well. History and constantly mm. kind of talk about it and examine it, you know, to, interesting. Um, you know, but I. Mm, interesting. It, it is interesting if that's what we were doing, but that's not what we're doing. You know, what, one of the concepts I, I came out, you know, it seems like among some Catholics, there's this desire for an external authority apart from the living out of one's faith. Mm, no, 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 no. But what if Nestorius says, look, I take communion every day. I even distribute communion. I'm living out my faith. I'm fasting. I'm praying. Therefore, what I'm saying about the Theotokos is right. You're going to say, wait, that's not good enough, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, so what, what we're doing here, we're, we're not saying we're looking for an external authority that's contrary or outside of living our faith or practice. That's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is there does have to be an objective external standard distinct from anything that I'm internally experiencing. If I claim I'm receiving the divine liturgies, uh, the divine uh, energies through the sacraments in the divine liturgy, I'm receiving the deifying energies of God, and they're telling me that Theotokos didn't give birth to the second person, uh, you know, and I start going into heresy, you're going to say, wait, Wait, the energies are not telling you that. They're not infusing you with that knowledge. They're, that's not right. And you're going to now start to make distinctions. And you're going to say, well, no, the church teaches. The church teaches. Aha, the church teaches. So now you're taking me to an external authority that's distinct from this experience. That's all we're saying. We're not saying it has to be apart from, but we're just saying it's distinct from because we realize this personal experience is not the ultimate uh, way to identify truth. It is a way to identify truth, but there are going to be people who are going to pit their experience against the bishops, which has happened historically in Eastern Orthodoxy. Definitely have, have that problem with the monks, not only today, some monks today, but you've had that historically. Go go look at Jaroslav Pelikan's uh, second volume on, on the Eastern Orthodox and the history of Christianity in the East, and he's going to bring out this uh, controversy that existed in the East and still exists where you're going to have monastics pitted against the bishops in the teaching authority and pitted against councils. So he'll talk about that. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're making a distinction uh, with here. Now, is it fair for us to then appeal to this external authority? Father, you're going you're gonna to say that an external authority exists. His name is Jesus Christ, right? I mean, isn't he the ultimate authority? Of course he is. Isn't the fullness of revelation given in him? Of course it is. Well, that's an external authority distinct from me. Now, that doesn't mean that Christ doesn't communicate and, and even reveal some knowledge through the sacraments that are given to me and the deifying energy. That's not what I'm saying. But you recognize that teaching authority is distinct if I were to start saying something that's heretical. You recognize that for Jesus. You even recognize that for the local bishops. 
You might recognize that for an ecumenical council, though you can't tell me what an ecumenical council is. Why don't you just, by extension, recognize that we would also make the claim for the papacy, for example? And it, it seems to me a good analogy of that, and who knows if it's fair or not. It is that original sin, is, you know, God originally calls Adam and Eve to this path of ascesis, a, a you know, by which they're called to grow into the likeness of him. But instead, they decide to try to do an end around God. And Excuse me, that is very, very uncharitable. Very uncharitable. We try to do an end around God? Really? That's not at all reflective of Catholicism. That might be reflective of some Catholics, but that's not reflective of Catholicism. Take a shortcut and give authority to something external to them, namely this fruit that will provide certitude, you know, for that becoming godlike, um, you know, where there's more mystery with that, you know, ascetical path. What? Um, you know, uh, to grow in God's likeness. Um, you know, and Com you know, people, the Slavophiles like Komiakov talk about this, this, this idea of an external authority that you see in, uh, you know, the Roman Catholic understanding of authority um, and desire right. for infallibility. Right. Interesting. Yeah, I, I don't get the impression you've really understood what Catholics, at least objectively, are, are claiming. So might be best to just not comment on it. All right. I, I want to just get to two more questions here, at least, if we can. Mm -hmm. um, and this one's a little prickly, Father Daniel. And, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> I, 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 I get a sense that you are familiar with the orthosphere, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there's a lot of y'all listen, because they're going to talk about Jay Dyer, not by name, but that's 100 percent who they're going to be uh, denouncing here. Um, toxicity out there. So, yeah, Jay Dyer um, sure. there, you know, there there are some very loud, quote unquote, orthodox voices that are speaking without authority and they're kind of sucking all the air out of the room. And they're not doing us any favors, to be perfectly honest. So here's what um, Lofton says, and this is at minute one, uh, I'm sorry, hour one, minute four, 25 seconds. He says, you'll find this online Orthodox group that tends to be very toxic. If that, yeah, and, and I'm I'm talking about the the Jay Dyers, the Ubies, the the people like that, right? Um, and they know who I'm talking about and, and listen to their comments here. Group of people has the truth. I would never know it by the way they behave. And the reason that I bring this up, Father Daniel, is I think we need to get this out in the open. I'm going to have a, a show about it, like, you know, just in terms of the, the atmosphere of orthodoxy online. But tell us a little bit about your feelings about how orthodoxy is presented online by independent voices. Yeah, um, I, you know, uh, I may, perhaps I don't know. I gave you the impression I was familiar with it. I, I'm very, really, only minimally familiar with kind of the Orthodox. Good. We're, we're not going to um, name any in, names internet, or anything well, like I, that. I, but I've, I've had to become a l tiny bit more familiar with it during COVID times. You know, having to yeah, exactly. To people in a right. parish, but um, and they say yeah. I watched the video by so and so and. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like the fathers say, you know, uh, the desert fathers, I've been sorry many times for things I've said, I've never been sorry for silence. Um, right. You know, we, we have to, I, I get very suspicious when people without some sort of Episcopal mandate, and that goes for both Orthodox and Catholics, put themselves out there um as a you know in a prophetic role we, we all know who they're talking about right clearly they're talking about jadar and others and others right some of the other people that he, he supports certain uh, priests and things like that within the church um yeah i you know so i i mean i i might agree with mr lofton there that yeah mm -hmm. i mean 
mm -hmm. know, freely admit, I yep. guess we have toxicity within orthodoxy. Uh, we're seeing it in the chat <laughs> um, yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, to you know, toxic people yep. sometimes in parishes and yeah, we have it over here too, but I, I would admit that it's uh, stronger on y'all's end, you know? Yep. Um, and we, you know, it as I've often said, the nastiest people have been the Orthodox. Um, and then the set of a contest, the nicest people to me have been the Muslims and the atheists. They've, they've been so much more charitable and respectful uh, than the Orthodox and the set of a contest. It, yeah, I mean, it, it, it can be a harm to our witness, but, you know, we held this right. treasure in, you know, earthen vessels. Earthen vessels, know? right. I, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I understand we're, we're going to have people who are in the church who do all kinds of wrong things and, and, and people are going to um, be scandalous. And, and, you know, you're going to have people who um, are, are sacramentally, you know, in, in the covenant, but they are Judas's. Like, I, I totally get that. I, I understand. I'm not saying that somehow disproves orthodoxy. That wasn't even why I brought up the toxic people. And I, and, and I, I thank you so much. You said that so eloquently and, you know, I might also just add that I don't think orthodoxy cornered the market on toxic behavior of certain individuals. Yeah. Well, I never said that orthodoxy did. Uh, although I think orthodoxy is in the lead right now, uh, at least in the online community, it, it's in the lead for, for that claim. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would think that you can find that in pretty much any denomination. Yeah, which is why I don't judge a communion based on that. Orthodoxy could still be right and still have all of these Judases and nasty people in its ranks. Absolutely. Of course. 100 percent. Any online forum where there are people and, and things get heated and people want to uh, assert their point and and defend their position and some people are better at it and 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 more uh gracious at it than others but i i think you made the point very very well um let's let's look at one more because i know we're at the top of the hour so we're gonna have to uh finish up here in a few minutes they the orthodox now here's the part the one that i've been waiting for the only reason why i've gone this song I uh, may or may not continue with the last bit after this. Here it is. They misread or they read a comment by Smoke Pork Ribs in the video uh, with Matt Frad. In fact, I'm going to play it. Uh, let's go to it here. And let's see. It is, well, I thought I had it pulled up. Hmm. Find it. Oh, there it is. It's on that computer. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Share my screen. Here's what happened. <laughs> All right, smoke pork ribs. Here we go. Here's what you said. Woman says, hey, really loving this discussion and learning more about Michael Lofton. Really inspired. Uh, well, I think it was actually a little bit after that. Inspired. I need to watch way yeah. more reason and theology videos. That's a nice one. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, this folk smoked pork ribs. Probably oh, not yeah. his real name, but it oh, yeah, could yeah. be. Do you know this guy? He oh, says, I, I do know him. By his pseudonym, I don't know his real name. Okay. I also left Eastern Orthodoxy, Greek, for Catholicism. They promote contraception under uh, econ economia. He says they promote contraception. Now, he's writing quickly. I admit it's not the choice of words I would have used. But they're reading him. Watch. Say so you say it? Economia? Mm, when economia. the church fathers yeah. are plainly against it. And now listen to what I say. Do I say they promote contraception? Watch. Bind loose aside. Thoughts on that? There's definitely a lot going on there because, of course, you have the um, Eastern tradition of divorce and remarriage and also permission of contraception. Permission of contraception is what I said. And among many of the Orthodox uh, bishops now. Some and here you can hear the rain going on. It's extremely loud in my headphones. So. 
some some of them are going to be opposed to it. Don't get me wrong. Um, and some would even be opposed to um, divorce and remarriage. But the majority tend to allow. Allow. Divorce. Permit. That's my language. Now, I'm not trying to call smoke pork ribs out for saying promote. I mean, that, that's not help. But hey, that's not what I said. Watch. They're now going to read the quote from smoke pork ribs. And then they're going to say, this is what Michael says. And then they're going to critique it and laugh at it and, and go off on it and act like it's really engaging what I was saying. And it's not. And then all of the people who are listening to that have now been misled into thinking that they somehow actually engaged what I was saying in the interview. Now, do I think that there was bad will? No. No. Do I think that they were intentionally trying to mis misidentify what I was saying? No, I don't think they're intentionally. I think that their work was extremely sloppy is what's going on. They're, they were careless. They weren't even trying to engage me well. That's what was going on. All right, so let's hear it. All right. This is at minute uh, uh, one hour 20. So he's literally quoting the minute where it's at. So, so you found the minute, and in the video, you see it's not me. Three minutes, 45 seconds. They, the Orthodox, promote con contraception under economia. That's what Smoke Pork Rib says. When the church fathers are plainly against it. What do you, what do well, you, how do you respond to that? Because that's a big one, you know, that's, the, the, that's, essentially... You, you, the, the Roman Catholics will say, oh, the Orthodox, they believe in divorce, which we don't. And I didn't say that. I, I know your randoms online say that. I don't say that. I'm a little bit more careful with my terms. And they are like they permit divorce. And I, I don't say that either. Economy is a little bit different than that. I think that's that's just way too much of a black and white statement and they permit contraception and i think that's too much of a black and white statement now the permit i did say although he's gonna then attribute that quote that he read here uh in just a second to me but the permit i did say and i do stand by that they do permit it as father is going to admit here in just a little bit but let's answer what he said there what he said there, what he said there, he, not spoke pork ribs, not the questioner, what he said there, talking about Michael Lofton, what he said there. And it was this quote that they read by P smoke pork ribs, applying it to me. What he said there. <sighs> yeah, y'all didn't even bother. <laughs> Didn't even try. Didn't even give me a fair shake. Didn't even bother to really hear what I had to say. And so I would say the act is uncharitable. Even though your intentions I know are, are, are good, the act is objectively uncharitable because you're not correctly quoting a person. You're misrepresenting them. Now, here they go, and they're going to go off on the idea of promotion promoting contraception and thinking that they're interacting with me and they're not that they promote contraception under economia when the church fathers are plainly again so i said excommunication for smoke pork ribs it's all your fault smoke pork ribs if you just didn't ask your question i mean i'm just joking i'm just playing <laughs> Yeah. So, well, uh, I mean, the term promote contraception. I mean, I, I don't know any Orthodox priest that's celebrating. <laughs> yeah, because that's exactly what I'm saying. Right. I'm just saying they're out picketing, you know, celebrating and, you know, all this. So, come on. Come on. And I'm sure the listeners are thinking, man, this guy's, you know, th this guy's so stupid. He left orthodoxy to ca for Catholicism. He just thinks that we're out over here promoting all this. Man, this guy's an idiot. Thank you for representing me accurately. You know, yes. um, yeah. you know I, I would say, um, <laughs> I would say it's pretty safe. There is a diversity of, of opinion out there to say that not using contraception, um, you know, would maybe be an ideal. 
Uh, here we go with the ideal language. <laughs> y'all Casper fans, are y'all picking up on that? <laughs> oh, y'all Walter Casper fans, the ideal. Here, th that's, and I'm not saying father's liberal. He, he's not liberal. I'm just saying that's liberal speak. <laughs> he's having to borrow this terminology for the liberals. That's exactly what the liberals of the church are saying. Well, marriage is the ideal, you know. Same-sex unions, well, you know what? The ideal is that they wouldn't marry, you know, heterosexual partners. That's the ideal, but, you know, so yeah, same-sex is not the ideal, but the, this is where we get it from. <laughs> so <laughs> you're now having to borrow from them. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Um, but the Orthodox teaching is kind of... Uh, contextual and again i'm saying the orthodox teaching there there's just a divergence that's, of voices on this you know exactly and and um, that's where they they y'all hear that cat disgruntled catholics who are considering eastern north did y'all hear that did y'all hear that i i just want to make sure y'all are listening to what they're saying here about contraception okay just just Listen, sort of corner us is they say, you guys don't even have one position. And well, I kind and, of shrug and, my and, shoulders and I say, so? So? I mean, y'all don't have one position. It would be like, we're, we're talking about objective acts that are gravely immoral. This is not a so issue. It would be like saying, well, you know what? You don't have a consistent issue on abortion. Some of y'all are in favor of it. Some of y'all aren't. So this is not a so matter. This is not a, you know, some really ivory tower theological, how many angels dance on the head of a pen. And this is not that this is something that affects lives. The use of artificial contraception is very important. It's, it's not a so. Uh, so what, why the so? You know, I mean, I, well, the, right. we have a technology and, yeah. that was never available before. So, um, Okay, irrelevant, because there's going to be some things that the fathers are saying that would include artificial, uh, as far as, I sh I, let me rephrase, that would exclude artificial contraception in spite of them not having certain technologies available. And and yeah, exactly. There there is a question of like being on a different wavelength um, here, you know, because Catholics they look at themselves as like we planted our flag in the sand on this one, and everyone else has fallen. Well, um, I'll say two things. Um, you know, I don't begrudge Catholics necessarily uh, trying to hold a sort of line on contraception, but. I would say their their doctrine on that is not contextualized, really. Are y'all ready? Um, you know, so we live in a two parent working household, a non agrarian economy. You know, um, which you know economically, children have become increasingly a burden. Wow! 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 Father said that. <laughs> Economically, children have become increasingly a burden. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, but um, this is really irrelevant. <laughs> Even though I'm, I'm not sure I'm gonna follow you on that one. But, but let's just so accept it for the moment. Let's just accept. Okay, they're an economic burden. Even though this is a foreign attitude to Christianity, but okay, let's accept it for the moment. Um, does that then make the objective evil of something no longer evil because of finances? If it's more economic for me to not get married and just like file separately, you know, so we can both get tax refunds or something like whatever, if, if it's more economic and we're in a very very you know tough times and everything it, it, is it permitted in some cases for me to choose based on my conscience and my 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 economic situation to just say well, you know, let's just you know let's just let's not marry let's just stay you know in the position that we're in 
and you know we'll file separately and everything blah 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 it is does that then objectively um mean that there's not a sin here okay now i'm i'm not look i understand familiaris consortio and stuff like that i i get that i'm i'm not i'm, I'm tabling situations like that i'm just talking objectively people who don't want to get married and just want to cohabitate right i'm talking about that especially not your familiaris consortio what do you do in that case do you do you say objectively oh, well you know there's an economic reason here so okay i don't think that's a good thing but it's there you know is the catholic church really promoting some return to an agrarian lifestyle that makes it easy for people are parishes really working to i can apply this elsewhere father i can apply this economic argument to other things does that then mean it's no longer an objectively evil act and that's the question is this objectively immoral now, I understand Paul VI kind of, you know, accepted the idea that outside of a marriage, somebody who's raped, may they may practice, um, <clears throat> um, they, they may take certain pills that are non-abortifacient, that are contraceptive, and, and where there's a high risk of rape, because um, the, the teaching of the church against contraception is, is directed towards marriages, right? Um, <clears throat> what's taking place with... Uh, you know, contraception outside of a marriage is already a problem because there should be no sexual activity taking place at all. So that that's the problem there already. Um, what Paul VI is really getting at is contraception in, in a marriage. That doesn't, again, make contraception outside of a marriage per, okay and permissible. But what it does mean is in the case of people who are subject to uh, a high risk of rape or something like that, and, and, and it's somebody who's not their spouse, that they're you know, in jeopardy to, would it be permissible for them to uh, take this uh, non-abortifacient contraceptive? That's what, you know, Paul VI is, is, is saying, okay, so I understand there's some very nuanced qualifications here. Objectively, however, in a marriage, 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 not in cases of rape, in a marriage, objectively, is contraception, the use of artificial contraception evil? That is the question. That's the question. And, and your talk about economics and returning to an agrarian society, irrelevant, irrelevant, irrelevant. It does not matter. It's irrelevant. The question is, is it objectively immoral? That's my question. Financially help out families so that, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, they can really make it work with lots of kids. Maybe, maybe some of them are, um, but not others. Um, but also, you know, you do get these situations, and, and I've personally known people, uh, Catholics with this, that the wife will get violently ill when she gets pregnant to the point of being hospitalized multiple times. And they deem it like, well, they can't have, you know, child, uh, you know, they can't have children naturally the rest of the time. So that means if you're a Catholic, if you want to still have sexual intercourse, you have to practice natural family planning for life. Right. That means that, you know, biologically at the woman's time when she's fertile, that tends to be when people most want to have. I mean, this is irrelevant because I could just say people who have same sex attraction, are they to be celibate the rest of their life? Are they to abstain the rest of their life? Okay. Um, <clears throat> unless they, they could enter into a, you know, a heterosexual marriage or something like that. But let's just say they're, they, they can't go that route. Um, aren't you going to say they need to abstain or are you going to say, well, you know, that this is just too much. This is heroic virtue is too much of a burden to carry. So economy is going to kick in and okay, maybe you could be with your same. No, you're not going to say that. Right. But why are you doing that now with contraception? Upon what basis are you going to say you can't do that with same-sex unions and same-sex uh, same acts, but you can do that in the case of contraception? Unless you're now saying the case of artificial contraception, it, it's not objectively immoral, right? Um, that then is where the debate is going to be. Sex. So you need a pretty like strong ascetical life. Mm -hmm. To uphold that if you're a younger couple and you've got to do that for decades on end here. 
at the same time. I mean, this is the same arguments people use to promote same sex acts. I'm, I'm just saying. Then the Catholic Church has really lost a lot of their ascetical tradition. They've lost a lot of the beauty in their worship that helps kind of support these things like that kind of. So God doesn't give us the graces through the sacraments. Interesting. Fasting. Um, you know, so it's like they uphold the teach. You know, Trent does condemn this view, Father. Now, I know you don't accept Trent, but Trent does condemn this view that you're espousing, that, that it's just too hard to uh, um, carry out the commands of God. That view was condemned because that view was being promoted by some Protestants, so Trent definitively condemned that view. I'm just tossing that one out there. But they've gotten rid of all those kind of supports for it, and they don't critique mm. themselves for not having those supports. Um, I, I, I mean, I critique all the time bad liturgies and stuff like that, but that still doesn't mean God doesn't give us the grace in the sacraments and we're incapable, however, of, of obeying God's commands. Again, that, that has been anathematized by the Council of Trent. I, so, I think the same thing is true about their unmarried priesthood. You know, if, if yeah. you want to look at kind of what the the sort of quote unquote problem is, I think that's a big one. You know, yeah. you have unmarried priests, um, and there's not necessarily the strong ascetical uh, backbone to support them, especially in that particular effort. So they kind of go hand in hand. This is a really yeah. good point. My, I mean, my, uh, I have a a, a Catholic friend. Uh, you know, and they're and we're coming up to the last few minutes here. Actually, you know, um, you know, maybe looking at things, but you know, she said something to me that I remembered is like, you know, like we we have a the Catholic Church doesn't even think that we can fast from fish on every Friday, but they expect you know you to like, you know, practice yeah, NFP right. for. You hear that? So here, here, Father, a former Catholic, confusing the difference between going against an objective rule, you know, doing something objectively evil, and something that is merely uh, disciplinary forbidden, right? A, a discipline as opposed to something that is objectively evil, right? Well, of course, when it comes to matters of discipline in today's climate, you're going to see, okay, even though you can argue it's not the best, yeah, you're going to see some laxity there. Oddly enough, the early church would say that your practices in the, as, as Eastern Orthodox are way too lax, right? Yeah, you have confession more than once in a lifetime, Father. All right, I mean, you're, you're going to find that even then. Okay, so we, we're all, we've all relaxed our penitential system. Uh, we have more than y'all have, and I criticize some of that for Catholics. I do criticize some of that. But relaxing a discipline is not the same thing as permitting something that's objectively evil. Those are completely two different things. You mix those categories and assumed that they were the same. And I have to ask why life <laughs> you know so it's too hard to there, not eat there, meat right right there's kind of this disconnect um there and i would yeah. say too and, the, the catholic church has economia they just don't admit it you know so well y'all heard that catholics we have economia we just don't admit it and you know where he's going with this right which also shows me father you as a catholic priest you should have known better than this uh, uh, it's it goes the same for it's the same for divorce, right? I mean, right. you can call it um, uh, annulment. annulment all you want, right. but come on. I'm, you know, well, th right. this I is, mean, these I are semantics. Like semantics. An annulment is just semantics. So the difference between an annulment and a divorce, semantics. I grant the annulment process is sometimes abused. I, I grant that. That's fine. But there is a fundamental difference between an annulment and a divorce. It is not semantics. It's a fundamental difference and it's not economia you should know better than that and you wanted to nitpick smoke pork ribs about promoting contraception you wanted to nitpick him on that but you don't nitpick yourself on the difference between you know the divorce and an annulment really
you know, Catholic canon lawyers joke that a good canon lawyer can get anyone an annulment. You know, I mean, people right. I've known people who've gotten annulments who have been married, were married 25 years, had five kids. And wait, first of all, marriage assumes, you know, an annulment says there wasn't a marriage. And you're saying there was a look. I understand some things are abused, but there is still a fundamental difference here. OK, um, we we are objectively are not saying it is okay now to um divorce and and then remarry what y'all are saying is yes it might be wrong but we are going to permit it we're not saying we permit it at all an annulment is saying no you didn't have a marriage to begin with because there was some impediment at the time of the exchange of vows so fundamentally fundamentally different thing and yes it is subject to abuse but abuse doesn't negate proper use and, and stuff like that and that doesn't take away from legitimate distinctions so we don't this is not practicing economia and, and any catholic canon lawyer would explain the difference between economia and dispensations in canon law there's a fundamental difference there even though i know you didn't bring it up it's a fundamental difference between economia dispensations and also economia and annulments fundamental difference annulment says you didn't have a marriage there at all economia says yes you did have a valid marriage but for various reasons we are going to allow you to remarry yes it's a penitential thing blah 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 but we're still going to allow you to have a second marriage when the first one is still binding that's economia it's not the same thing as an annulment and you should know that you right, know, right. Um, yeah. So and, there's, and that's there's not to disrespect. Just, no. Yeah, that's not, not to disrespect Catholics. And but that was disrespectful to Catholics. Let's be fair. That was disrespectful. You say it wasn't to, to disrespect. So I'm again, assuming your intentions were good. I'll take you at your word. But objectively, that was disrespectful because you objectively completely distorted our distinction between an annulment and divorce woefully so dreadfully so what you could do is just say look y'all have this fundamental distinction and there is a big difference there i just think that y'all abuse the annulment process that that's fine i'm a, i'm gonna agree with you there father i agree i agree but you go too far whenever you say it's the same thing or it's economy of blah 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 and and i might may i just add one more thing and then we're gonna wrap it up um and that is, you know, maybe the Orthodox don't speak with the kind of one black and white voice regarding contraception, but our better writers and our better presentations go out and look at the encyclicals on marriage and family life on the Orthodox Church in America page, which I think is absolute. And, and then go and read that in opposition to other Orthodox churches, just saying absolutely one of the clearest, best presentations on the subject. It is crystal clear that they say, you know, you as... And it's crystal clear for your sin. I'm just saying, you, you know the way this works, right? This, this applies to your sin it only. As a married couple, you need to be thinking about having children and you need to weigh all of these options right. and you need to understand that you are only you're limited to certain forms of contraception. But no matter if, if you use it, you will answer to God for that. According to your synod. OK, what, what about the next synod? And that's not yeah. just a, a, an economy, a blessing like go ahead and do it. It's like this is a serious thing. Now, we might be. We might be guilty of, you know, allowing this too much. And I think, in my personal opinion, I think maybe we we did. We just kind of like sure. blow it off. Um, we're, sure. we're not talking about it at all. But um, I, I think they're misrepresenting our position here. Oh, we're misrepresenting your position. Really? Okay. All righty. I know I didn't misrepresent anything, but I sure heard a whole lot of misrepresenting of me personally. And I heard a lot of misrepresentation of Catholics in general. Okay. Now, if I've been guilty of any misrepresentation, uh, fathers, y'all, y'all reach out to me. Please let me know. I would like to apologize for that. I would like to correct that. I, I'm not trying to misrepresent uh, Eastern Orthodoxy in any way. So if I have done that, please let me know. But you want to talk about misrepresentation? I mean... <laughs> Okay. 
Well, they, they, they don't understand it, you know. I would say that's true of you, yes. Um, it, I mean, again, they just, they kind of look at it like we're being wishy-washy and liberal and we're fallen just like the rest right. of Christians. So, Well, I mean, Father and Feminist, you did use some pretty liberal arguments to support your view there. I'm, I'm just saying. They, right, you know, there's right. just a lack of understanding, you know. Excellent. Father Daniel. You and again, I'm not saying father's liberal. I'm just saying to defend this position on contraception, he had to appeal to some some of the liberal apologetics. And I would say, father, you're inconsistent because if you apply this to same sex marriage, it's going to be problematic. Just did such a great job, and I'm happy to meet you even online. If you ever come back to Pittsburgh, please uh, would love to get together with you. Uh, you and I are uh, alumni of the um, uh, Duquesne University. Uh, I was there much longer, a much, much. Somebody's asking what economia means. Effectively, long story, there's a lot, a lot involved in economia. Uh, but in this context, it means a relaxing of the uh, obligation, if effectively. Um, <clears throat> a lot more that could be said there, though. Before you, uh, and uh, <laughs> thank you Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your time tonight and best wishes to you for the end of Lent and for Holy Pascha. Thank you, you too. Thank you for having me, Father. Thank you. Before I share a few final thoughts, I again want to offer my sincere thanks to Father Daniel for joining us tonight. Thanks to Trudy for engineering the program, for everybody that's listening in, those who gave us questions and those who called in. I'm not going to sort of rehash what we talked about, but I do want to read these words from the first letter of St. Peter. And here's what I was talking about at the beginning, and then we're going to end with this, but uh, why are we reading this? Because listen to this verse. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And we should have stopped there. I'd been like, eh, okay, whatever with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers... Father, when did I defame you as an evildoer? Why are you bringing this up in a review of my material? Those who revile your good conduct... Father, when did I revile your good conduct? ...in Christ may be ashamed, for it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. When did this happen? I'm just saying. I, I'm not saying everything he says has to be applicable to me, but I mean, this is an entire show about dealing with my material. And you did start it out by calling us detractors. And so I kind of wonder, uh, who's he talking about uh, defaming and, and all that? I know what the scripture is talking about, but how is that applicable here? Uh, it just seemed very uncharitable, Father. It, and, and so I would respectfully say that um, I, I think that wasn't... Um, wasn't the best move, but if I've been uncharitable on my end, I apologize. I'm not trying to be uncharitable. Um, I know you're, you're probably not trying to be either, but I'm just saying, objectively speaking, it seems like some things were, were uncharitable. So I, I do appreciate the interaction with my material, even though I think that you did very little interaction with my material. I, I should say, I appreciate the attempt to interact with my material. I don't think that you did interact with my material, either of you. Um, and, and that's, that's something I say charitably. I still look forward to having father on the show. We'll talk about, you know, his, his conversion and his perspective and look forward to having an engagement with him. But I, I did want to give a response because I thought that, um, I was definitely misrepresented in, in many occasions here as y'all have clearly witnessed in three hours and 45 minutes. So I got to go. <laughs> Hope y'all have enjoyed it. Don't forget to comment, like, subscribe. Please check us also out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us, help get me out of the workforce so I can do this full time. That way I can have, uh, you know, mul multiple shows a day, all kinds of other stuff instead of just kind of having an evening show. But, uh, hey, we'll, we'll still continue to do it even if, you know, it just remains part time. We'll still just continue to do the shows as is. But uh, just, but just saying, throwing it out there. If you want to support us, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. Till next time. God bless.